Recording? Yes, we are recording to this. Okay, great. Welcome everyone to the June 14th, 2023 Open Space Board of Trustees meeting. I will call the role of the trustees. Michelle? Here. John? Present. Um, Caroline? Present. And I am here as well. So Brady is. If Brady is, uh, have we heard from Brady? Um, I do see two um, phone, two people calling by phone. So Brady, if, if you are one of the folks calling by phone, if you don't mind just putting a note in the chat. Well, we Sorry, will... I got a text from us at two minutes. Okay. Two minutes. That was one minute ago. So you should be joining. Great, thank you. We'll proceed and hopefully he can join us momentarily. Uh, I will call now for approval of the minutes. Um, if anybody has any additions or corrections to the minutes, uh, it's a good time to bring those up. And so we will start with page one of the minutes of the May 10th, 2023 board meeting. Uh, any additions or corrections on page one? I have one under agenda item three. Okay. Um, in the second paragraph, the beginning of the second paragraph, where it says I shared my concerns regarding Caroline Mil uh, Miller's pattern of absences from four of the past six business meetings. Um, I did say six months and I checked the video to make sure um, that I did actually say that, but it's six months rather than six fixes business meetings. So replace business meetings with months. Yeah. Okay. Any other additions or corrections? How about uh, page two? Hearing and seeing none, uh, page three. Megan, I had a question uh, in the bolded section where it starts with Michelle uh, seconded. It says the motion passed four to one, but I think it passed four to zero. Right? That was a correction I, I made after the fact. So it was on the digital. Just oh, like, sorry. Not on the okay. Copy. Great. Okay. Yeah, I, now that you're saying that, I don't think I looked at that. That's okay. <laughs> so, it, it does say four to zero on okay. the record now. Uh, any other additions or corrections to page three? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of May 10th, 2023 meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, we'll do a roll call. Michelle? Yes. John? Yes. Caroline? Yes. Um, you can't vote. I'm abstain because I wasn't here. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Uh, have we seen Brady? Yes, Brady's on. Brady now. is a yes on the minutes. <laughs> hey, good hearing you, Brady, and thank you. Uh, yep. And I vote yes as well. So they, the approval of the minutes passes. Mm -hmm. um, Samantha, I think if we can go over the public comment, one, one thing I do want the public to know is that uh, none of the agenda items are scheduled for a public hearing. So if you'd like to speak to any of the items on the agenda, now is the time to do that during public comment. For those speaking on the Prairie Dog Management item on the agenda, the board will um, certainly hear your comments, but we will not respond until that agenda item uh, comes up for discussion so that you don't bifurcate the kind of the conversation um, in different parts of the meeting. So we'll uh, keep track of the comments and if a response from us is warranted, uh, we'll deal with that under the item itself. Uh, so, Samantha, do you want to go over the rules for public comment? Yes. And see now. Okay. The city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. 
This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and board and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experiences, and political perspectives. For more information about this vision and the community engagement processes, please visit this site. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, and other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. Participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by, and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently, only audio testimony is permitted online. And then we do have uh, a handful of folks who have signed up in advance. If you would like to, to speak and you have not signed up in advance, you can use the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see that, um, you'll see in your participants box, the little three dots on the bottom right, you can click raise hand and that will raise your hand for you. We do have a handful of people who have joined by phone as well. If you would like to speak by phone, you can press star nine. Okay, I will stop sharing from here. And how many people do we have signed up currently to speak? We have 15 that signed up in advance. Okay. Um, Usually there are three minutes uh, for public comment. Um, I think we will adhere to that. Um, but when, once we get to around 20 or so, then I think uh, we may go to two minutes so that there's a reasonable uh, time for the board to have its uh, discussion on the various agenda items. So uh, we'll start with three. And if uh, not too many more sign up, uh, we'll continue with that through the whole public comment period. Otherwise, uh, we may go to two minutes if it looks like more people are signing up. Okay. Um, so first up, we have Stacy Stoutenberg, followed by David McKenzie and then Paul Brubaker. So Stacy, I'm going to allow you to talk. You should be able to unmute yourself now. And Stacy, are you able to unmute yourself? Is that, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Should I start? You can get started, yep. Okay. Um, I just want to alert that I, I've had brain surgery, so um, I just, it's kind of hard for me to read. So I appreciate your patience. Thank you. It's, my name is Stacy Stoutenberg, and I live at 1251 Pintail Circle, Boulder 80303. In May, we have been living in our home for 23 years. I remember the first, I remember waking up the first time when, when we first in our new home and it was at the crack of dawn to the sound of birds. It woke me up and it really surprised me. There were so many birds. I had been living in Denver and I realized how glad I was to be living in Boulder. The neighborhood where we live is called the Reserve. How fitting the streets are named bird are named after birds. Here are some of the examples in our in the street names of our house of our neighborhood. There's Mallard Court, Songberg Circle, Swallow Lane, and I live in Pintail Circle. I've noticed um, over the years that I don't hear the birds nearly as much. I I am very concerned about the marsh and it's located just down the street from me. I know the marsh is very important for the birds. Thankfully, we've had a lot of rain these past few weeks. The, the, but before the rain, the marsh was mostly dry for most of the year. Without the rain, the marsh is just a dry hole with salt at the bottom and no birds. It's very disconcerting, it's very concerning. I am requesting that you manage the marsh 
the way you used to so that the birds will come back. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, just for your information, if you do want to go on the open space website uh, for the meeting materials for this meeting, uh, there is an update from staff on Sombrero Marsh that uh, may be of interest to you. Thank you. Next up is um, David McKenzie, followed by Paul Brubaker and then Robert Murphy. And so, David, you should be able to unmute yourself now. <clears throat> And uh, David, let us know if you can't unmute yourself. It looks like you should. And David, I've asked, I sent a request to ask you to unmute. Can we go to maybe the next person and then come back? We'll come back. Just put the five or seven three up this like. Oh. Okay. Next up will be Paul Brubaker, uh, followed by. Uh, and then we'll come back to David McKenzie and then Robert Murphy. So Paul <laughs> Baker, um, I am not seeing here. Do one more quick check. Um, and if uh, Paul, if you are joining us by phone, if you could just message me in the chat. And then I'm going to, uh, I'll move on to Robert Murphy next. Um, there we go. And Robert, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay. Um, I was delighted to see that um, you're opening up um, Prairie Dog Mitigation south of J Road. Uh, particularly on the McKinsey property. Um, we have lived adjacent to the McKinsey property for the last 33 years and uh, have seen some, quite frankly, some bad management by the city of Boulder. Um, this used to be beautiful pasture land that uh, Sombrero Ranch used to use every winter to winter their horses. And now it has been horribly managed to the point that um, <laughs> The topsoil is blowing off um, on our, the last uh, windstorm a month ago, we had two feet of topsoil that was deposited on the other side of our fence. So um, I applaud the fact that you are um, bringing the McKinsey property um, into a removal area and hopefully um, we can manage that property better. Um, the city owns a lot of water that comes off the Cottonwood Trail um, ditch. And so um, the irrigation should not be any problem. If um, you need volunteers to help work that property, I know uh, me and the other properties that adjoin that property would be glad to pitch in. Um, I will also say it was, it's was it been very, very uh, disappointing that the city had leased this land to a farmer who then after a year or so pulled up and left and left behind hundreds of feet of small um, uh, plastic piping that, you know, is just horrible for the environment. So again, um, that's the end of my comments. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Robert. So, We'll go back to Dave, David McKenzie, uh, who I see is back on. I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself, David. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, can you all hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that, a little technical difficulty. Hi, my name is David McKenzie. 
my wife and family and I live at 5600 Nelson Road uh, between 55th and 63rd on the south side. Um, we own the black and white draft horses called Mackenzie Shires. We have noticed also that during the last windstorm, the topsoil had at least two feet of that blow into our pastures and the prairie dogs have gone ballistic here and they're um, devegetating so much that we've for the first year had nothing but weeds in our pastures um, and it's just uh, we are dry land and we usually have some luck with decent um, forage for our horses but this year because of the wind and because of what's to our west blowing in it's just nothing but um, just you know terrible terrible weeds and what we're basically wanting to know is how are you all going to manage this and if we are going to have a uh, relocation or a removal nearby to our south and to our east. Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate your comments. Right. Next up is uh, Paul Brubaker. Um, and Paul, I've, I've if you could just put in the chat, uh, I do see a handful of phone numbers on here, so I'm not quite sure um, which one is you. So if you don't mind just putting in the chat which one is you, and I can uh, make sure that you have permissions to speak. And maybe we come back. Um, okay, next up is Bill Platts, followed by Elizabeth Platt and then Cindy Warren. And then in the meantime, Paul Brubaker, if you could, oh, uh, if you could just make sure that you put in the chat. <clears throat> and I am not seeing Bill Platts, so we'll move on to Elizabeth Black. And Elizabeth, you should be able to speak now. Unmute yourself now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'm Elizabeth Black. Heal members like many things in staff's proposed changes to prairie dog management. We like the expansion of project boundaries to include all irrigated ag system wide. We like bringing lethal control in house, stopping relocations to the southern grasslands, improving irrigation infrastructure sooner, and increasing burrow disturbance deaths, depths. Prairie dog advocates have told us six to 12 inch depths will not harm the critters. However, we don't like the categorization and redesignation of properties. Categories A and B together include only two properties in the northern project area and nine properties outside of it. Does this mean abandonment of the northern properties? Please guarantee progress in the north with clear metrics on how much land will be cleared annually there. Also, please increase lethal control of prairie dogs to 200 acres per year, the number council has already approved. Yes, category C and D properties are harder to remediate, but if you break it, you need to fix it. Over the last 20 years, these properties were broken by mismanagement. Please fix them instead of redesignating them to hide the destruction. Consider Bell Grove bordered by the diagonal J and 47th in category C. This gateway to Boulder used to be a beautiful hayfield with grazing. Now it's an embarrassing wasteland of weeds. Once cleared, it would be easy to keep prairie dogs out with its surrounding roads and fences. Grazing and diversified vegetables irrigated with farmers and CBT exchange water could jumpstart a young farmer here. We have improved its irrigation. You have improved its irrigation, key lined and cover cropped Bell Grove. Why throw away that investment on coexistence with prairie dogs, guaranteeing noxious weeds and furious neighbors? Steel on 55th near Nelson is in category C2. An experienced farmer tried to lease it for years and kept getting put off. They report no irrigation when free water is available. <clears throat> and no coordination with other North Tollgate ditch users. Steel's new diversion structures and gated pipe have sadly gone unused. We get it, irrigation is hard. It's not a nine to five job with weekends off. Steel needs a farmer to make the irrigation work. 
OSNP lessees and neighbors are a huge asset. Partner with them. Loan lessees your perk machines. Harness the energy of young farmers with low-cost leases to remediate properties. Coordinate prairie dog control with neighbors to reduce the need for expensive barriers. Get farmers back on your land. Our video of soil erosion on OSMP shows the future of category C and D properties if prairie dogs are not controlled. Just Google soil erosion, OSMP, Boulder, Colorado, and watch our precious topsoil blowing away. None of us wants that future. Let's work together to fix it. What do you have to lose? Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you. And we do have a couple of folks we'll come back to and chatting with right now to make sure that we can figure out who those are. Um, next up will be Cindy Warren, followed by Harold Cassidy and then Linda Parks. So Cindy, Cindy, um, you should be allowed to unmute yourself now. Are they seeing the timer? Even I'm having some trouble. It's not showing it. So I'm going to keep the timer running and just I can try to share. Yeah, we've got the timer oh, on Zoom. For oh, yeah. some reason on the screen, it's not popping okay. up. So if you, yeah, yeah. it was on the screen. I'm sorry, you said this is Cindy. And this is, uh, yes, yeah, Cindy, Cindy Warren will be speaking next. So yeah, we can see. Oh, thank you. Begin? Yeah, yes, you may begin, yeah. I'm Cindy <laughs> Warren, and I'm here to discuss the current situation at Sombrero Marsh. In Mr. Burke's recent memorandum titled Sombrero Marsh, he notes it is not uncommon for marshes to be dry for a year or more. This is in contrast to the Sombrero Marsh site plan, which states that the marsh can be dry for up to eight months in a dry year. This is the first time I've heard the city discuss a dry period of a year or more, and that is very worrisome. The last time the city put water into the marsh was over a year ago, in late May of 22. At that time, a small amount of water was supplied for eight consecutive days, that no additional water was added for the remainder of the water season. To date this year, the city has supplied no water to the marsh since mid-June. In early May, a resident emailed city staff regarding the dry marsh. The reply he received stated the city was exploring options and, quote, hope to improve conditions there in the coming months, end quote. If the city is exploring options through September, when the water stops running, the water will no longer be available and the marsh will likely be dry throughout another fall, winter, and spring. This pattern could continue indefinitely. Note that if the city doesn't supply water to the marsh, then precipitation is the only significant water the marsh receives. Minimal runoff reaches the marsh as it is surrounded circumferentially by ditches. Although these ditches may supply some water via seepage, this is not documented and the amount, if any, is unknown. The marsh had completely dried out last year by late September and has been dry since that time other than after heavy rain or snow. This means the marsh was dry for both spring and fall migrations last year, for spring migration this year, and likely fall migration this year if no water is added. No birds visited the dry marsh this spring. There were no migratory birds that had previously used the marsh as a stopover to rest and feed. The shore birds, wading birds, and numerous herons were gone as well as the more common birds. In addition to the marsh birds, other wildlife has also been affected by the lack of water. The nesting birds have markedly decreased as have the once numerous raptors. Fox, raccoon, and coyotes are no longer seen. The chorus frogs, which were previously everywhere and always underfoot, have essentially disappeared. Last year I saw two and this year I have not seen any. The heavy rain over the past several weeks has supplied water to the marsh. Although there are occasional birds there now, they are not numerous and there has not been a change in wildlife overall. We have shared our concerns regarding the wildlife with city, city staff many times. The staff, staff says the management of the marsh has not changed. Having lived next to the marsh for 20 plus years, I disagree with that statement. Although the amount of water supplied to the marsh in a given year has been variable, never before has so little water been supplied to the marshes last year, which was minimal, and this year's, which is none to date. As you know, the trustees learned of the city's plan to build a factory next to Sombrero from citizens. Please take our concerns to heart when we tell you that the character of the marsh has drastically changed in a negative way over the last two years. The marked impacts we're seeing on wildlife must be taken into account. Certainly a dwindling wildlife population is a cause for concern and not evidence of a healthy marsh. Sombrero Marsh is one of Boulder's most treasured environmental assets. We implore you to become involved and ensure the marsh receives enough water to be functional. Please preserve Sombrero Marsh. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Cindy. We appreciate your comments and support of Sombrero Marsh. Thank you. Okay, next to speak is uh, Harold Cassidy, who I am not seeing on. 
Um, so we can come back to that, to Harold Cassidy. Next is Linda Parks, followed by Kevin Markey and then Paula Schuler. So, um, Linda Parks, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, my name is Linda Parks. I live downtown, city of Boulder. I'd like to thank you all for the work you do, but I'd like to also support everything that Elizabeth Black has stated in her um, uh, talk when, when she called in. I'd also um, like to talk about Boulder Valley Ranch, someone who's boarded horses out there since 1994. And um, you are doing some mitigation out there and I understand more is to follow, but um, we really do need to address what's going on there and what cover crops they decided to experiment with in pasture lands. The horses do not eat beets and turnips, they eat pasture grasses. And so the city has come in and um, burrowed it and planted beets and turnips. And uh, we have so many weeds, bull thistle, we're seeing buffalo burr. I spent hours and hours and hours pulling buffalo burr and weeds. I'm one person out of a handful of boarders. We, we can't take care of these lands. We need the city to step up, get in there, plow all those fields, weed mitigate, so we can have a herd of 23 like we used to have, and now we only have fields that support eight horses. In terms of Gun Barrel Hill, a 30 year restoration process now gone wrong. Grasslands are stripped bare, yucca gone, buffalo birds taking hold in the east section. Nesting birds will have very little to nest in and to produce their young. Um, the city really needs to address how much tax dollars they've spent of mine over 30 years to restore grassland so that they will allow prairie dogs to eat the entire thing and have topsoil blowing all over the place, weeds coming in and no habitat for the nesting birds, which was why they said they were restoring the, the uh, grasslands in the first place. As for the Papini property, a beautiful open space to the south of Boulder Valley Ranch, it really should be saved. The city went in, they, they replanted, they reseeded prairie dogs in there. They put in thousands of pounds of plastic, which is now all sticking out of the ground. You have no grasses, you have bindweed, you're losing your soils. And I don't see much action going on on Papini right now to keep the, that grassland um, in the state it was prior to prairie dogs being put out there. Um, we should really look at that parcel because it is a treasure and it is quite beautiful with its ponds and um, it's a lovely open space. Um, I really think you should stop relocations altogether and spend the money on restoration of our lands. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Let me, let me ask you, I didn't catch the ranch that you referred to initially. And Linda, you should be able to unmute yourself again. Apologies. It's the Boulder Valley Ranch open space. Boulder Valley Ranch. Okay. Right. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, we have Kevin Markey, followed by Paula Schuler, and then Suzanne Webel. And I am not seeing Kevin Markey. So, Kevin Markey. Oh, I'm sorry. I, sorry about that. Okay, so Kevin, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, thank you. My name is Kevin Markey. I live at 8853 North 55th Street. Um, we live three tenths of a mile south of the Bennett and Steele properties. Uh, I've I've emailed you all, all of you uh, a lengthy email uh, about the issue of prairie dogs. I'll just summarize a few points. For years, the city's nearby open space parcels have been little more than breeding grounds for weeds and prairie dogs. We were hopeful when the city started this program and we've watched some of the activity nearby and we are in support of a number of the recommendations that the staff has made. However, we have concerns about categorizing parcels 
categorizing the parcels is a useful management planning exercise, but not if it justifies abandoning management efforts uh, in North Boulder County project properties. While we acknowledge the difficulty of restoration within the rules and assumptions, we are unconvinced that these properties are impossible to restore. So we have several questions and suggestions. For each parcel, what treatments and improvements have been applied to the parcel? What specific infrastructure needs are required for success? What ecological values might be in conflict uh, with prairie dog control or restoration? What properties no longer have water rights and why? What are some of the assumptions underlying the estimated costs? Are there more cost-effective means of achieving the same results? What specific needs do neighboring landowners have regarding prairie dog management and open space? And what particular risks are faced by neighboring landowners? For example, steel and Bennett parcels adjoin or close to several horse properties. We've wondered when uh, reading the report why more alternatives were not employed or explored. If irrigation is no longer an option, why not reestablish dryland grazing or use restorative grazing to enable dryland crops? Attract agricultural lessees to parcels and give them a relatively free hand. Uh, find out what factors contribute to the success of independent lessees. Of course, some might argue that a lessee uh, might never have the same incentives uh, uh, as a private owner, but the city has chosen to purchase these lands and is their responsibility to manage them as good neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next is Paula Schuler, followed by Suzanne Webel and then Alvin Sherman. And Paula, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, my name is Paula Schuler. Prairie dog management in the project area has proved very positive, slow, but very positive. I am pleased with most of the management modifications staff is presenting. I have always advocated that OSMP needs to move outside the project area at some point and remove prairie dogs from all irrigated fields, return them to healthy parcels and be a better neighbor. Yet there are two management modifications that I do not like. The category system staff has presented and the suggestion to change property management designations on some irrigated lands. The category system appears to want to put the brakes on removals for many of the parcels in the project area. I would like OSMP to make a firm commitment to finish all of the project area in a timely manner while also taking on parcels outside the project area. A few specific parcels. Brubaker and Stratton are scheduled for partial removal this year. Yay. The remaining portions of those parcels, Brubaker North Pasture and Stratton Southwest are relegated to category C. The Brubaker North Pasture is a very straightforward removal. The fence on North Brubaker at the Crow John Ditch is beyond the Colorado Parks and Wildlife quarter mile buffer zone guideline for nesting eagles. In addition, those buffer zone guidelines end on every year on July 15th. A food source is not a problem. There are thousands of prairie dogs on Boulder County's portion of Brubaker and on Table Mountain just across the street. Brubaker North Pasture should not be in Category C. It should be in Category A and managed next year. Stratton Southwest is also in Category C. The entire Stratton property, including the Southwest corner, was a glorious parcel with no prairie dogs when it was purchased by Open Space in 2007 for $3.2 million. The Stratton family irrigated the Southwest portion. Soon after Open Space purchased the property, prairie dogs moved in, and then more prairie dogs moved in. No one irrigated that corner, and now it needs serious care. Staff has very recently made irrigation improvements, key line seeded and spread compost, but none of those actions will make a significant difference until the prairie dogs are removed and the irrigation repairs are complete. Bennett is another parcel relegated to category C. OSMP has invested a lot of time, money, and effort into that parcel in the last several years. A challenging parcel, but a decent foundation has been laid. Keep the momentum going. There are farmers willing to manage Bennett. 
Work with another farmer, try new things. What do you have to lose? I realize the project area parcels have gotten a bit more complex, but when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So let's go, think out of the box, finish the project area and manage more acres per year. Lastly, OSN MP and OSBT should tread very lightly when changing parcel management designations. Changing anything to a PCA or MOA will only restrict management options, not enhance them. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Okay. Next is Suzanne Webble, followed by Alvin Sherman and then Jonathan Moore. And Suzanne, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yeah, I think I just did. Great, right. we can yeah. hear you. Suzanne Webel, 5735 Prospect <laughs> Road. Almost 30 years ago, I had the extreme good fortune to be able to purchase my dream farm. Beautiful, untouched raw land with 360 degree views. There was no legal access, no fencing, no water, no electricity, no gas, nothing. It has taken 30 years of hard work, but it is now a show place of a productive farm with a balance of hayfields, horse pastures, wetlands, high mesas, woodlands in a riparian corridor, and more. We produce certified weed-free hay so that people can take their horses onto public land and to reduce the weed burden in our part of the world. However, about 15 years ago, a new neighbor arrived next door, City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks, which purchased the 128-acre Bennett property for $3.5 million. It quickly became the poster child of how not to manage public land. OSMP prevented the conscientious tenant who had grown up there from managing the prairie dogs, which led to the land becoming a barren wasteland of noxious weeds, prairie dogs, and destabilized soils that blow away in every windstorm. The tenant could no longer make a living, so she moved to Nebraska. And now the property is so hopeless, OSMP can't find anyone to lease it. Thousands of Bennett's prairie dogs are coming onto my farm. As a result, I've had to spend unbelievable amounts of my time and resources managing them and the weeds they introduce. They are not compatible with my hay production and their holes make the lane we maintain as a trail unsafe for horses. They even gnaw at OSMP's expensive wood fence posts causing the fence to fall over and requiring constant maintenance. Along with many of our neighbors, I participated in OSMP's Prairie Dog Management Plan for the Northern Tier. We thought we had achieved success in getting the board and council to approve limited lethal control for prairie dogs, and I hoped that Bennett would be at the top of the list for treatment. This property was historically irrigated and has the water shares to do so. But, now we learn that instead of honoring the management plan we had all agreed on after only three short years, staff seems to be saying that they're going to abandon many of the properties in the Northern Tier to prairie dogs because farming is hard. Yes, indeed it is. But as other people have said, you bought it, you need to keep fixing it. Also, staff is proposing barrier fencing only to prevent prairie dogs from recolonizing your land with no concern for your neighbors who are overrun by your prairie dogs. We need you to be good managers. So please reconsider your proposed um, new prairie dog management plan in the Northern Tier and think of us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay. Next is Alvin Sherman, followed by Jonathan Moore and then Will Palmer. So, Alvin, you should be able to unmute yourself now. And Alvin, I do see you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Can... Okay. Um... Alvin, if you could try unmuting yourself one more time. I do see again that you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. So uh, Alvin, maybe we'll come back to you. Um, okay. And then uh, Jonathan Moore will be next. Okay. 
Jonathan, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. All right, perfect. Uh, Fred, I just heard about this last night, so uh, my comments are not maybe that succinct, but I'll be as quick as I can be. I live at 5740 Prospect Road, so around the corner from 55th, neighbors of Suzanne's, Kevin and others. Uh, for whatever it's worth, I've worked for local governments at various times. I've worked for Jefferson County, Douglas County. I've been a planning commissioner in Clerkey County. I've worked in planning, zoning, open space. And I spent 12 years as the deputy director of Colorado Open Lands doing land and water conservation work. My comments are more principal at this point. I'm disturbed by what the proposal is. Uh, and essentially what I want to kind of emphasize is that when you acquire lands, you take on a responsibility to be good stewards of that land, and you take on a responsibility to be a good neighbor to your community. You know, please think about the fundamentals of like a land ethic from Aldo Leopold, Wendell Berry, caring for the land, being a good neighbor to your people. The city, in my opinion, has a heightened responsibility to this. You're a public entity. These lands have been acquired with public dollars. Principally, my comments are related to Steele, Bennett, and I think it's Abbott below Boulder Hills, which is almost my adjacent neighbor. We run horses, we run sheep, we do a lot of things on our land, we cut hay, uh, and I am deeply concerned about this. Uh, as you've heard, as private landowners, all we do is spend time and money controlling weeds, invasive species, improving soils, improving grasses, improving irrigation, acquiring additional water rights, improving efficiency of irrigation systems, and I believe you take on that same responsibilities. In my opinion, to reclassify these lands, to shift dollars and resources to you know, easier irrigable lands to the south is essentially a cop-out. It's abandonment, in my opinion. Uh, just because it's tough, just because it's expensive does not give the city the right to negate their responsibilities here. Uh, my, my final comments, and I will be more organized by the time this you know, comes around to hearings, is if you own it, you need to maintain it. Look at Boulder County. They have done an amazing job around Lagerman Reservoir. I've only been there for nine years and they have transformed those properties through diligent care and eradication of prairie dogs among other things. Um, and in my opinion, so that comes down to two things. If you're gonna do it, as Suzanne has mentioned, you know, or if you're not going to you know, work to eradicate those, then in this case, fence your prairie dogs in, please because they are moving across all of your neighbor's lands and we are spending our own private dollars trying to figure out how to not have them degrade our properties. And secondly, if you're not willing to do that, in my opinion, and I hate to say this, you should sell the lands because you are not being good stewards of those lands right now. I appreciate your time and I hope you take these comments seriously. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, uh, I'm going to go back to Alvin um, Alvin Sherman, who is calling in on a phone. And so Alvin, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Awesome, thanks, Sam. Uh, my name is Alvin Sherman. I live at 1242 Meadowlark Drive. I'm from Boulder and I love it here was great to be a kid here. One of my favorite things to do was ride my bike down to the 7-Eleven. They had candy and Slurpees and it was one of the first places to get the new Super Mario Brothers video game. Uh, my friends and I would scrounge chains together and we'd buy penny candy at 7-Eleven then we'd play in the field behind the building. It was a beautiful natural field with tall tan grass lots of different grasshoppers and dirt piles we'd use to make bike jumps. That field is gone now. Now it's a big blob of condominiums that blocks out the sky. There's no more grass, no more grasshoppers, and no more dirt piles. That's a common story in the U.S., but it doesn't happen here in Boulder very often. We blend our lives with the environment and don't sell out whenever a slick developer makes easy promises. Sombrero Marsh is more than grass, grasshoppers, and dirt piles. A lot more. I live on Meadowlark Drive, and I have to say that I was shocked to discover that there are really meadowlarks here. 
when I was a kid, I only heard them when I went fishing or camping with my dad way out in the country. We have other birds here too. Two months ago, I saw a Stellar's Jay. I'd never seen one before. It looks like a cross between a blue jay and a peacock. That was the only time I saw one. There aren't as many birds here as before, but they're not gone forever. Not yet. Please don't turn Boulder into a place with streets and neighborhoods named for things that no longer exist here, that we developed out of existence. I want Boulder to continue to be a town that doesn't sell out, not unless there's a good reason for that, for real helps people, and this isn't that. Please make Sombrero Marsh mean something for real. Thank you. Thank you, Alvin. Okay, um, next we have Will Palmer, and then we're gonna go back to a couple folks on the list who may be have joined since we called their names. Um, and Will Palmer, if you can put in the Q&A, if you're joining by phone, I believe you mentioned you're joining by phone, so we know who you are so I can unmute you. That would be great. Um, while you're doing that, I am going to go back. I see Harold Cassidy has joined. So I'm going to uh, and Harold, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Awesome, great. Hello, my name is Harold Alexander Cassidy, and I live at 1434 Meadowlark Drive in Boulder. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Sombrero Marsh this evening. You've heard about the low water levels there. Um, and... I wanted to um, basically what I want to do is send to each and every one of the uh, open space board of trustees board members um, some questions, some comments that were sent to the city regarding an environmental assessment for the uh, factory site and it included a lot of questions that had to do with Sombrero Marsh. And I also going to send you a map so that you can see the wider area impacted by this factory project. Um, the project, the way that it's being unrolled, I guess, is basically um, the city is saying everything is just fine out there, no problem. And in fact, Dan Burke's telling you the exact same thing. No problem, nothing to see here. Uh, every once in a while, the marsh gets dried out. Um, I guess what I can say is some of the comments, for example, one small one, you know, they've got a, uh, they, the Preble Mouse is known to be out there on that property, um, open space adjacent to the factory site, and the factory is going to be constructed during an active period for that critter. And so the city is saying, well, we're just not going to do any construction at night and we'll follow best practices for stormwater management. That's how we're going to handle it. Um, so not okay. And I would have to say that I feel like the way that the marsh is being handled right now is really not okay. It Nobody seems to be advocating for it at all. So really what I have for each and every one of you on the board, I'm going to send um, these comments that you can see, you can see what I'm talking about but really is a call to action to get involved, find out what's going on, don't take Dan Burke's word for it, and uh, you know, dig into it and find out if, you know, uh, if, you know look into the concerns that people are raising here, like Cindy and, and others. Um, and I think that's all the comments that I have, thank you. Thank you, Harold. Okay, so we, um, it, Paul Brubaker, Bill Platts and Will Palmer, if you are joining by phone, uh, just message me in the Q&A and I will uh, come back to you. I do see we have one hand up from someone joining from a call, could be one of them. So I'm uh, going to call on this person with their hand up and then uh, please make sure you introduce yourself. You should be able to unmute yourself now if you're calling in by phone and had your hand raised. And 
I for the caller who has their hand up. Uh, I have given you permission to unmute yourself. I'm going to send you a request to unmute yourself. Okay, and I see you've unmuted yourself. But we ha uh, we're not able to hear you right now. Still not able to hear you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, yes. Okay, good, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I'm Bill Platts and I'm here to discuss Sombrero Marsh. I've lived directly across from the marsh for over 30 years. I've never in my life seen the marsh as dry as it's been over the past two years. I've also never seen such little wildlife. The birds, which were so numerous, have nearly vanished. And while Baseline Reservoir has been full of migratory birds, there were none at the dry Sombrero Marsh. The disappearance of wildlife has been a sad thing to watch. At your last meeting, Dan Burke mentioned that the city could put water, could not put water directly into the marsh. That's true and has been the case for years. As he mentioned, the city typically uses flood irrigation of adjacent land to get water to the marsh. They have water rights that enable them to do this when East Boulder Ditch is running, and it's running now. The city could call for water, flood irrigate, and get water to the Sombrero Marsh at any time. They just have not done so, despite record amounts of rainfall. The city staff says nothing has changed with the marsh. I live there and I see what's happening. Things have absolutely changed. In his recent Sombrero Marsh Memorandum, Dan Burke states that maintaining the health of the marsh is challenging given its location in an urbanized setting with among other things, adjacent industrial development. Presumably he's referring to the pr proposed factory which will be manufacturing houses. Although the city has previously told citizens the factory would have no impacts on the marsh, it appears they have reconsidered. Citizens agree that the proposed factory would have significant negative impacts on the marsh. Would these impacts be considered less significant if the marsh were dry with minimal wildlife present? Is the city's decision to supply less water to the marsh related to the proposed factory? We don't know the answer to these questions, but we believe they deserve careful consideration, particularly as a recent decrease in water to the marsh coincides with the city's plans for the adjacent factory construction. As you know, the trustees learned of the city's plans to build the factory next to Sombrero from public comments by citizens at your November mi meeting. City staff who had known about the factory for a prolonged period of time did not inform you. Please listen to the citizens now. We are telling you the truth. All we want is to preserve the marsh. Sombrero Marsh is one of Boulder's most unique and valued resources. Please step in and see to it that it gets water and remains a functioning marsh. You appear to be the marsh's last hope. Please protect it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Bill. And I have not received a uh, notice from Paul Brubaker or um, Will Palmer, and I'm not seeing any more hands. So, so that will conclude our uh, public comment. And I do want to thank everyone who commented. Uh, I think this was the first where no one exceeded the three minute <laughs> limitation, which was uh, impressive and appreciated. So thank you for that. And more importantly, uh, thank you for you, all of your um, certainly uh, insightful and uh, considered comments. We appreciate hearing from you and uh, we'll be responding in various capacities, both at this meeting and in other venues as well. So. With that, uh, we'll go to matters from the board, of which there are three. Um, we'll look for comments on the written information that was provided in the packet. Uh, John will update us real quickly on the Boulder Junction area plan project. 
And then I want to remind the board that we have a diversity, uh, equity and inclusion training a week from today. Um, so we'll reiterate that to make sure everyone's got that on the calendar. So do board members uh, have any comments or questions on the written information that was provided in the packet? I, I do, and they're not major things, but I have some um, questions and comments on each of the three. Okay. Um, so should we start with North Sky? Yes. Um, North Sky, I see that dogs are leashed year round, but banned May 1st, to July 31st to protect um, bird nesting habitat. And I'm just wondering whether, um, you know, like raptor um, nesting um, bans, yeah, raptor bans, uh, not bans because of raptor nesting. Um, is there going to be monitoring and is there a possibility that they'd be lifted or, or that would they, would this be closure be like in place no matter what is happening? Yeah, I'll let nesting. Heather, sure. we can talk. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, the grassland nesting bird closures are a little bit different because they're protecting a wide suite of species that nest at different times during that time frame. So unlike the raptor sites where we have individually identified nests that we can monitor and, and if they're not used or they're not successful, we can lift the closure. This is a whole sort of community that is being protected. Um, so we do do grassland nesting bird monitoring system wide every single year. Um, it's not specifically on nests because finding and monitoring grassland bird nests is um, incredibly intensive and difficult to do. Um, so we typically are doing community surveys to understand where the highest densities and diversity is. Um, so that time frame would be consistent from year to year. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and also when the trails are closed, when you're working on them, I would just um, encourage you all to lean on partners to get the word out as well. Um, and not just your own sort of feeds, but, but um, I know BMA has a big following and Fido's and I think those crazy trail runners still have a group as well and they run all night long. So you know, so call them crazy <laughs> trail runners. Um, and then, you know, the horse groups and stuff. So just, I would just encourage you all to lean on them to get the word out. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's it. Great. Um, do you have any? Okay. I've got uh, three questions. Um, Jeff, uh, how are we doing permit wise on the trail project? That's a good question. Um, right now, we're actually waiting on the final grading permit from Boulder County. Okay. Um, and I do have our um, visitor infrastructure senior manager, Chad, he's on the the video this evening if we want to get more information but from what i understand we're expecting that any time now we're just working through some of the final discussions and back and forth with the county um, but we anticipated in june within the month and is that the last last one that's out there i believe so okay. um, just wait yeah so i just was wondering is that going to affect the schedule the construction schedule do you think or Slightly, uh, our original intention was, you know, we were hoping to be in construction now, uh, basically after Memorial Day to start. So um, we're off track, off schedule, just a week or so. Um, but, and I can certainly let Chad speak to more specifics. However, you know, I think during the season, we'll just have to see how the work goes. Um, the reality is with all the rain and kind of bad weather we've had, you know, we've might've had some delays anyway, so. Um, I think we'll we'll still perhaps be able to make up time and work through the this this season into early next year, uh, but I wouldn't anticipate a significant delay or schedule challenge. Um, and so, are we doing much of the construction in house, or we're contracting? I know we're contracting the at least the bridge Correct. installations uh, and other parts of the project, or are we mostly in house? mostly in-house. Um, in fact, it's one of our, if you remember our trails field trip, I think it was last year, we right. talked a lot about our hybrid approach. And so a lot of in-house crews um, working with, in fact, you mentioned BMA, some of the volunteers from BMA, um, youth corps, a variety of volunteer days that we hope to have on the trail. Um, yeah, and then we do have contractors doing the major bridge project. 
Um, but most of the work will be, when I say in-house, you know, working with our staff, working with crews and volunteers. So that, that's a good segue into my, one of my requests would be, uh, especially on the uh, big volunteer projects. Um, and I know in other past projects, uh, we've been very careful, but I would encourage and urge us to be extremely careful with that number of people out there given the you know sensitivity of, of the area so hopefully um you know there aren't congregations of many people you know in, in uh, specific areas but that uh, we're treading as lightly as we can yeah for sure um and that's one of the things and you read in the the memo that was included um, our ecologist staff and basically a multidisciplinary team throughout the project has been involved in planning, designing, and even into the construction will be kind of checking in and inspecting and, and talking through the different project areas. Uh, but yeah, even through the construction, we're trying to be as light on the land as we can and sensitive to some of the, certainly the high value resource areas. Great, I, and I had no doubt of that. I just <laughs> yeah. wanted to uh, reiterate the importance of right. that from the okay. board's perspective. Great. And the last thing I had, it, it, it somewhat struck me uh, a bit humorously, but um, in the memo, it says that there's been two miles of undesignated trail that's been removed. But so I guess my question is, um, is the fact that we're designating some of the undesignated trail, <laughs> is that included in the removal, the two mile removal? uh number because in my mind a, a trail is a trail and so we, we it may be undesignated but then if we are designating an undesignated trail uh i don't consider that to be a removal yeah if i could megan is chat on the yes yep. oh there you go hey chat can, can you hear can me for that one mm -hmm. yeah yeah yes for sure so um, you're totally right, Dave. <laughs> it's um, we're removing I hate two it when miles. That happens. <laughs> I, yeah, it happens sometimes, right? Yeah, um, yeah rarely. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. So yeah, basically from you know going from like North Foothills Trail, you know the Hogback area, heading north until you hit the fence, basically, um, or private property fence. That's the two miles of undesignated trail, kind of following the railroad grade there that we'd be removing from the system. Granted, we're putting a designated trail basically in the place, in place of that. It's not gonna follow the exact alignment fully because we're gonna have better drainage and, and um, you know, provide some opportunity for some experience there, but it's mostly for drainage and sustainability. Um, there are some advantages though, taking it from our undesignated trail data to a managed trail. One, we're adding sustainability. There should, there will be, you know, following our trail standards, there'll be less erosion, less impacts, and we're basically transferring it into a managed situation versus in a more unmanaged situation. So yes, the numbers are, we're getting rid of two miles, we're adding three plus miles of trail, you know, to the, the designated trail responsibilities and um, system, but there are some advantages to it also. Great, and all I would encourage is that uh, when we discuss that, that we say basically what you just said, um, so that people understand that, you know, that um, there, there's gonna be more present management presence um, in the area than uh, currently exists. and. Hopefully that will uh, uh, be an, uh, a positive uh, for um, the very sensitive area that it's going through. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other comments on that? Um, Sombrero Marsh, did, Michelle, did you have some yeah. questions or comments? Yes, I, I just want to say that I really appreciate staff looking at this. I know this is a really complex topic. Um, you know, this is a, an urban setting and with residential, commercial, and industrial there. And we're going to have some people with some strong opinions. I appreciated um, the memo on that. Um, you know, and I, I hear or heard somebody commenting that it's typical that, that there's a statement in the, um, in the memo about 
it being typical that the marshes dry for up to a year. Now, I just want to, I read that sentence over again, but it says during dry and drought years, it's not uncommon for it to be dry for up to a year. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that point. And then also, you know, when is it that it last happened that it was dry for that long of a period? Do you, do you know approximately how long that has been? People are talking about sort of anecdotally, I've lived here 15 years and it hasn't been this bad. Do we know the last time that it was um, dry during a drought period? Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that. I know that we just went through a period where we had uh, several months of continuous dry period starting last fall into early this spring until when it filled up again uh, about a month ago uh, or, or began to get water. So, but in terms of that uh, streak that maybe you're referring to as maybe over a year or something like to that extreme, I'd probably be reliant. Maybe Don, I don't know if Don is available with us today to speak to. Yeah, he'd be He's better. He's been at it for that. many, many years. He might know if we've had a situation of that type of prolonged dryness, but we have just went through a period of, uh, you know, six months probably of, of more of a dry condition out there. Don, welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, Don Rico. <laughs> Senior Resource Project Manager and Wetland Ecologist for Open Space. Um, the last time, um, without uh, digging into some of our uh, historic data and aerial photos, uh, the last time I recall it being dry was in the early 2000s when we went through a drought period. Um, it was it was dry to the point where um, it it uh, during windstorms it would it would uh, blow a lot of dust and uh, uh, kind of salt residue because um, Sombrero Marsh is a, is a um, very um, saline uh, marsh. It's not a freshwater marsh. So um, for about a year, um, and I can't recall exactly if it was over a year, but and it was 2001, 2002 maybe, when um, we experienced that severe drought that Sombrero Marsh was completely dry. Don, uh, let me add just a little more historical perspective. Um, you know, the county uh, managed Sombrero before the city actually acquired it, and the, the county uh, annually did put water into the marsh so that the marsh stayed, I don't know whether it's full, but it stayed uh, with water uh, earlier on, many years ago before the city acquired it. But from my perspective, um, you know, and I think your memo was a very good one and, and uh, mentioned this, that, you know, it was a, a, a wind feature, you know, a blowout. And obviously, if there's water in there, it's, that's not how it gets created. And also, people have said that they thought that it was a buffalo wallow uh, pre-European settlement and, and anything like that. So... Just anecdotally, uh, certainly there have been cycles of dryness and, and wetness, um, but the creation of that depression uh, was obviously not a water-related feature when it was created. It became a water-related feature uh, after it was created. Yeah, that's, that's generally correct. We don't have um, real hard data uh, on that, but we assume geologically that was the case, that it was a dry um, area that was subject to severe wind erosion and it caused that what's referred to as a blowout. And then um, the, uh, the kind of general uh, understanding now is that beginning in the, about the mid 1800s when um, irrigation became prevalent in the Boulder Valley um, with the construction of the East Boulder Ditch and the Enterprise Ditch being upgradient to the east of the blowout, that's when it became more of, I won't say it went from dry upland to marsh, but it became probably more wet because of leakage from the ditches and possibly just irrigation in what was, what was once Sombrero Ranches, which is now the reserve 
um, neighborhood to the south. That was a big horse ranch there. And then of course the property to the east um, that's currently owned by the city and the county. Um, those were all agricultural lands that were flood irrigated from those two ditches and also other laterals and ditches in the area. I had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, our last speaker, Bill, um, had said when he was speaking that when the East Boulder Ditch is running, that we are able to provide water to the marsh that way. And then on our written um, memo, third paragraph says, in more recent times, the seepage from the East Boulder Ditch, which is what um, you just said, Don. And I don't know if when we did that, it was because county was doing it. So could anyone speak on um, how the seepage, um, it, it says that has likely been influenced. Is the seepage um, positively or negatively influencing the marsh? And then um, just to clarify, are we able to do um, water management when East Boulder Ditch is running? Um, so the, the answer to the first question of how the ditch influences the marsh. So most ditches typically leak. They're not, unless they're lined with concrete or other, by other means, but there's a fair amount of loss, they call it tra um, uh, transmission loss, from where the water is diverted from the creek to where it's put onto the land. So there's a certain amount of loss there, and that's typically just leakage. Um, Sombrero Marsh sits on the, the bedrock under Sombrero Marsh. It's, it's very close to the ground surface, and it's an impermeable marine shale called Pierre Shale. And so when the ditch leaks, um, um, some of that water, not a lot, but some of that water, when it leaks, it migrates down gradient um, hits that shale layer, isn't able to permeate any deeper, and then flows to the lowest point in the landscape, which in this case is Sombrero Marsh. So that's how the ditch influences the marsh, um, positively or negatively. I guess it all depends on the way you look at it, but um, it has a positive hydrologic influence, I guess, um, due to leakage. And then your second question about the um, about using our East Boulder Ditch water rights. Um, and they, I've heard several people say that um, when the ditch is running, we can put water, we can divert water from the East Boulder Ditch. Um, that's only true if we are the water users that actually requested the diversion of water from South Boulder Creek down the East Boulder Ditch for our use. As an example, um, one of the East Boulder Ditch water right owners is XL Energy. They take water from the East Boulder Ditch and they use it in um, Hillcrest Reservoir. And so when they're calling for water, that's that's their water. Just because you see water in the ditch doesn't mean we can take it because the assumption is that if it, it's in the ditch, somebody has called for it and they're entitled to that because they own that as real property, as a, as a water right. So again, we, we would have to call for um, through the water commissioner, we would have to call for water, exercise our ability to divert water from South Boulder Creek down the East Boulder Ditch and then divert it onto our property east of the ditch. And I wasn't writing fast enough. Um, what did you say that Excel, where did they take the water? Um, they've used it historically in Hillcrest Reservoir, the cooling lakes around the old power plant there. Thank you. And so, Don, we do uh, call for water to uh, later in the summer to irrigate uh, those upland grasslands. And uh, certainly we, we think that some of that water, again, uh, makes its way into the marsh eventually. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, don't, I think as far as putting water in the marsh currently, that doesn't make a lot of sense. The marsh has a lot of water in it uh, at this point. So um, I, I guess I'm a little perplexed that we should just be dumping water into the marsh uh, whenever we can. Uh, you know, it's it's certainly uh, full and yeah. uh, f functional as, as a marsh um, right now. I was just curious if historically there was a time frame where that was happening in some form of a regular basis and then it stopped 
or if that's not the case. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> yeah, All I know is that uh, calling for water right now to irrigate the upland grasslands doesn't make a lot of sense. The, you know, the ground is basically saturated. Yeah. And so uh, we wouldn't uh, make a call for water uh, at this point, uh, given the, the current situation. Yeah. Uh, so uh, any more on Sunboro Marsh? Thank you for that. Uh, the Chautauqua Access Management Plan. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments on that? I do. Um, gosh, when CAMP was implemented, I think it was on the Chautauqua board. Um, so I could just see it on all sides. <laughs> um, so I just been <clears throat> curious, like uh, given the low ridership, can we say that the shuttles are not working? Um, so I'll just list my questions and, and maybe you won't have answers tonight and that's okay. Um, and then with the 2,700 citations, um, do we have those broken down by whether they were issued because people were going over their paid time or were they not paying at all? This is my second question. And then um, the third one I have is, <laughs> How, I, and I don't know if at Regent Hall, um, if there are like a B-cycle station there, but have we tried offering free e-bikes from Regent Hall with directions on how to avoid baseline to get up to Chautauqua as an alternate way to get there? That might be fun for some out-of-town visitors. And keep them off baseline because that's deadly. Um, and then the fourth one is the TDM. Um, you know, only 10, says that only 10% of the Chautauqua employees are using the shuttle. Um, and I'm just wondering if other incentives have been considered and um, what you all know that um, CCA has, has offered their employees. Again, I don't need answers to all those tonight. No, these are great. We'll, we'll, we'll capture them. And Francis is on the phone. I don't know if she has any answers tonight, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Francis, I don't know if you have any comment on that, or I know we'll be taking notes of those and working with the project management staff, but. That's what I was going to say. I can coordinate with the broader city team. Those are great questions, and we'll um, get back to you sooner or bring them to the August meeting. Great, thanks. Uh, so, John, I think we're ready for you to do a quick update on the Boulder Junction uh, area plan. Yep. Uh, so I just wanted to share with the board that I attended the kickoff of the Boulder Junction Phase Two Multi-Board Working Group. Um, we're taking a look at the results of Boulder Junction Phase One. A lot of the project is around um, cleaning up land use um, across Boulder Junction Phase Two, um, and there is some open space, other designated lands in there that need to be cleaned up. And my understanding is staff's going to come with some recommendations next month to share. Um, I don't want to steal their thunder. I just wanted to uh, share an update that I've been attending. Great. So we'll, uh, at the July meeting, uh, we'll actually uh, have a presentation and uh, a decision point, I think, right? Or... Yeah, well, uh, it's kind of a parallel process. Part of the land designation cleanup includes some small, narrow strips of OSO, uh, and we'll be coming forward with some recommendations for the board to consider on, 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 on OSO. Great. So by Thanks. cleaning up, we're talking about simplifying the designations and consolidating. Is that what, I don't know what we mean by clean up. Well, for us, uh, for, for us, what OS, what the OSO designation would, would mean is uh, what would be the future of that OSO designation be? As we've seen in other areas, sometimes the OSO was placed in areas that because of how they were placed might not have covered the original area that was the intent. Sometimes they were larger than uh, the area they're intended to cover. Sometimes they don't no longer serve an open space purpose uh, uh, in staff's minds. And so cleanup would be is just recommendations of, do we move forward with the OSO uh, designations? Uh, if so, are they in the right spot? Or do we consider maybe not moving forward with a continued OSO designation in the area? Those are pretty much the options that staff would be weighing and coming forth with the recommendation. And 
in in general they're cleaning up land use codes yeah. across the area even outside of open space where you know you think of commercial industrial residential right there's a lot more modern zoning and land use codes that allow you know commercial on the first floor and residential above um so a lot of it involves updating you know really old uh zoning in the area to more modern zoning yeah, Brady, I don't know if you know uh, what OSO means, but open space other, but it, it's a planning, it's a planning designation. It has no official association with the open space in Mount Parks Department until we make that determination. So it, it was basically part of the either the Boulder, Boulder County plan or um, blanking part of the 1986 or even corresponding with a uh, open space tax like right. where would we use it right. so decades ago they yeah. kind of sprinkled oso around the system of right. saying these are potential areas that open space might be interested in so basically it tips us off to saying uh hey do you all have an interest in these because it's oso it's it kind of puts a focus on it, does it Does it serve an open space purpose that the department might be interested in? Yeah, another good example of that that you're familiar with is um, in South Boulder Creek at CU South. You know, there's actually a major OSO designation that, uh, you know, the, de the department, the city has uh, worked on and stuff as part of uh, that whole project. So that that's another example of, you know, what the city can do, but basically it's, uh, we are making a determination of what we think ought to happen um, once this pro this area management plan gets approved. Thank you. And so changing an OSO designation to some other um, purpose does not require disposal, correct? It does not. It's in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan is where that designation rests. So if there was a change of what the board's purview is, it is that under the open space board's purpose is that if there's any open space related items that are changed or uh, within the Boulder Valley comprehensive plan, this board's purview would be to uh, review that recommendation. So that that's why the OSO, even though it's not a part of an open space system, that's where there's purview here with this board uh, based on that nexus for the Boulder Valley comprehensive plan. Great. Uh, thanks for that. And I've noticed that our, our schedule is, is completely hosed. But You're fired. <laughs> yeah, right, right. We, we, were, we were so giddy on the, uh, the adherence to the schedule. And the Don't give up yet, needs. Dave. Don't give up. Yet. Come on, we can do this. Not, yeah. We can make up yeah, for it. Yeah, right. So, Dan, I think uh, we are ready for matters from the department. All right. I'm going to now save my 10 minute introduction into this. Next item, and just turn things right over to Sam McQueen, who's our business uh, uh, services senior manager, who will lead us into our next iteration of our 2024 budget discussion. Thank you. Yes. And uh, I'm joined by Lauren, who's going to share the presentation. So thank you, Lauren. How's it looking now? Are we... uh, we're having some issues maybe on our end. It's not show, it's not. Uh, Lauren, we can see your notes. Well, that piece is okay. Let me try this again. Um, and it's, it's more so there's something happening where it's not showing. Oh, oh it's show, it was showing. But it is screen. showing on the Zoom. Yeah, sure. Share screen. We'll try this again. Can, can you see it? So we can see it and see it on, our, on our computer screen. We're having issues with the uh, just, just the this, but anyone who's on Zoom is able to see it. So let's there we go. That looks good on our end. Looks good here. On the zoom end anyway. Um, let's see. Always leave and come back. So just turn my around. Oh, we can't. Oh, we can't. You're right. And that. Um, this is Let's see if original size is different. <laughs> Window. 
Okay, something. Curtin, do you have yours open? Or? Do you want somebody else to try to share it? Uh, it's different. Yeah, so it's now Lauren and Megan's computers both. But it's not, I don't think it's them because we're okay. seeing the, we're seeing it on the Zooms. Uh, it's just, it's just this projection to that TV. If I think so, she can see it online. I'm wondering if maybe we can get one more computer over here. If somebody wouldn't it. mind just squeezing in and sharing. Yeah, I can bring mine over. And Sam, let me know if you think there's value in stopping and resharing or anything like that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, well we're, we feel pretty confident it's something up with the tablet and screen. Yeah, we can see okay. it kind of on our okay. You're going to okay. pull it up. Yeah, that could work. I'm going to try one more thing and see if this helps us, but. No, there's. What do you think, Jeff? Do you... <laughs> what about turning the TV on? And the uh, view here also is looking. I really like that. Mm -hmm. All right, trustees, you all ready to go? Yeah, all right, we're ready to go. Okay. Um, Thanks for thank you for your flexibility while we uh, figure out what's going on with the technology. Um, so thank you also, Laura, for sharing your screen. So hello and good evening, trustees. I'm Sam McQueen. Uh, I'll be presenting the draft 2024 operating budget tonight. And Cole will be back with us at the next business meeting. Next slide, please. So we'll start tonight with an update on our budget development process. We'll review the operating budget structure and operating budget requests. Then we'll save time for questions and discussion at the end. Next slide, please. Are these Are advancing for you, Sam? No. Uh, no. Well, so we're not seeing them, but oh, they are not oh, advancing. They're not advancing. Oh. You're not in um, presentation mode. Okay, there you are, but. Now they're okay, in. Now we're going. Okay, okay, there we go. Yeah, so next slide, please. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, so we're revisiting our 2024 budget development time on this slide. Tonight is our third touch on the 2024 budget. We'll be back in July with additional details and any changes to the CIP and operating budgets, as well as public hearing and OSBT recommendation on the items. Next slide, please. Starting with an update on the budget development process. It didn't go. Oh, yeah. I think I'll leave um, it off presentation mode and just see if I, that helps. Can we do it? Yeah, again? and uh, Megan actually can do it also. So we could see. Oh, yeah. So. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so starting with an update on the budget development process. At this point, the finance department, and department is refining personnel projections and other guidelines that are used to develop OSMP's budget. We'll have details to share on those guidelines during the July business meeting, including projected costs for staff salaries and benefits, which make up two thirds of OSMP's operating budget. We'll be sharing, we'll be submitting our budget details to the finance department later this month. Then they'll be submitted to the city's executive budget team or EBT. Next slide, please. As a reminder, these are the four components of OSMP's budget. Last month, we focused our discussion on the CIP. Today's presentation and discussion will focus on the operating budget. Next month, we'll bring the CIP operating budget revenues and reserves together. <laughs> the operating budget is comprised of a few different layers. It starts with the current year's base, then additional costs from budget guidelines from the finance department are layered on top of the base budget for items like staff salary and benefits, vehicle repair costs and technology costs. The finance department also provides revenue projections, which are reviewed against these expenses. 
After we've accounted for new costs and the revenue outlook, we can look to adjusting core service budgets. These adjustments are reviewed for priority in the department, city, state, or other requirements, and feasibility to implement on a fixed term or ongoing basis. We'll review the department's 2024 budget priorities later in this presentation. Any increases uh, we submit beyond the base budget and budget guidelines requires a budget request. An example of this could be the addition of staff to support ongoing core service projects and programs. And we'll look at those budget requests later in the presentation. Within the operating budget, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so within, uh, I think it Lauren was sharing. I'm oh, she sure. was sharing. Ah, oh, got it. And Lauren, I think we're on slide seven now. Yeah, they're still not advancing. Lauren, I can just share my screen. Okay, let's do that, Megan. Seven team efforts. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you to the team for helping. So within the operating budget, there are four different expenditure types. There are personnel expenditures, non-personnel or MPE expenditures, cost allocation and debt service. And we'll look more closely at the 2024 amounts in each of these categories next month. So the Open Space Fund supports the entire operating budget, unlike the CIP, which is also funded partly with lottery dollars. We're also working with city leadership to determine if funds for the recent climate tax will support work in our department in 2024. OSMP no longer receives general fund dollars, but we do still partner with other departments through memorandums of understanding. Next slide, please. OSMP's base budget is built off of the previous year, so you're seeing the department's 2023 operating budget here. At a high level, this chart shows how operating dollars are spent on core services in the department. You can see that OSMP generally spends a comparable amount on programs and projects within the community connections and partnerships, resources and stewardship, and trails and facilities service areas. Much of the central services budget is used to support and supplement programming in other service areas, including expenses related to operational facilities, technology budget, and other operational functions. Any budget requests shared later in this presentation will be in addition to the dollars you see here. Next slide, please. The department has made efforts to tie our operating budget to the master plan. We're able to tie the current year budget for non-personnel and seasonal and temporary staffing costs master plan strategies in a similar way as our approach during the budget presentation of the proposed CIP last month. We're hoping to make connections between standard positions and master plan strategies in upcoming budget cycles. This chart shows combined investments of the 2023 operating NPE and NSPE and the 2024 draft CIP into the five master plan focus areas. You can see that a large part of the operating budget supports the financial sustainability focus area, which includes strategies for taking care of what we have and investing in workforce development and operational needs. Programs that tie to these strategies support ongoing maintenance and operations work in the department, including reduction of the trail maintenance backlog, fencing replacement and repair, software application administration, and records management. Next slide, please. So shifting gears to the last part of our presentation, we mentioned that any increases to base budget require submission of a budget request to the city's executive budget team, which consists of city leaders to ensure a consistent city budget approach. If budget requests are approved by EBT, they become part of the city manager's recommended budget in the fall. OSBT review of the budget runs concurrent with EBT review and will submit the proposed budget request to the finance department later this month as part of our draft 2024 budget submission. The information will be compiled and submitted to EBT for review after that. As a reminder, next slide please, thanks. <laughs> as a reminder, we presented an outlook of the budgeting process during the April business meeting. We'll touch on many of these themes tonight. First, the department is looking to program increased revenue projections into the CIP and operating budget. We're also partnering with city leadership to understand climate tax funding in 2024 and program related needs. 
Staff have also closely reviewed the definition of CIP to determine if funds would be better managed as operating budget. And finally, as you've seen in the May and at this business meeting, we'll continue to connect budget components to the master plan. Next slide, please. The budget requests included in your business meeting packet tied to a handful of priorities for the 2024 budget. Our annual and long-term priorities for the budget incorporate actions identified in the master plan and approved plans, recommendations from the OSBT during the fall retreat and business meetings, and priorities identified during the budget planning process. During the question and discussion section tonight, we'd like to hear from you if, you if we've captured your feedback into our priorities for the 2024 budget. Our 2024 budget priorities are building ongoing capacity for fire mitigation work, acceleration of efforts in science and climate resilience, acceleration of work that supports presence on the land, moving funding for agricultural management and undesignated trails programs from the CIP to operating budget to make them ongoing parts of our work, and making additional investments in equity programming. Next slide, please. We'll jump into specific budget requests for the last part of this presentation. This month's packet detailed budget requests for standard positions, non-standard positions and staffing contracts, and non-personnel requests. For standard positions, we're requesting three types of changes. The first is conversion of positions from temporary to standard to comply with the Affordable Care Act and meet business needs whether they're ongoing or fixed term. These conversions won't add headcount, but they will have some minimal costs associated with changing benefits between the temporary and standard categories. An example of this is our signs maintenance technician, as business needs in this program have changed and require year-round support of an in-house position. We're also requesting new positions and increases to FTE for certain positions. Next slide, please. Next category is non-standard position requests. We shared at the last meeting our plan to shift many ongoing maintenance costs from the CIP to operating this year. 595,000 of those shifts will support non-standard staffing needs, including funding for three agricultural crew member positions. And while we try not to build many positions in the CIP budget, when the preferred alternative CIP project was proposed in 2020, for example, we were still assessing the best delivery method for the work, whether that was contracted crews, vendors, or in-house support. We determined that hiring in-house staff for these projects is best and are now seeking to operationalize the funding for those positions. In our work with the finance department, we're also learning if OSMP will receive support from the climate tax fund next year. There are a few budget requests detailed in the packet that are currently supported by the climate fund and may need to move to the open space fund in 2024. They represent critical climate resilience work that we want to continue next year, whether they're funded by the climate tax or open space fund, including the addition of forestry assistant crew leads and crew member positions. We'll remove them from the July packet if we learn that they'll be funded by the climate tax next year. We're also making requests to increase service delivery in certain areas like funding for an undesignated trail crew and have also shown where we need to account for increased operating costs to maintain current service levels. Next slide, please. So the same categories are shown here for non-personnel budget requests. In the category of shifting funds from CIP to operating budget, we're proposing to operationalize funding for work, including the restoration of native vegetation along South Boulder Creek and Boulder Creeks, and implementation of tall oak grass control strategies, which have historically been funded in the CIP, but are really ongoing needs in the department. We're also requesting to increase budget to account for additional costs to maintain current service levels like increasing the budget for supplies and materials. And finally, we're looking to increase dollars to support additional service delivery in some areas, including contracts to support youth engagement work. Next slide, please. And for our next steps, we'll be coming to the OSBT for the last touch of the 2024 budget planning process in July, which will include a public hearing and CIP and operating budget recommendation. Next slide, please. So does the OSBT have any questions regarding the department's draft 2024 operating budget? Thank you very much. Thank you for bearing with the technology issues. Okay. Um, so <laughs> let me uh, ask the board, does anyone have any questions for Sam or Lauren? Uh, I'll jump in and say thank you for such a clear presentation. I got all the way through it. I think it was very clear. Um, 
and there were some improvements from last year in terms of the formatting uh, that made it even more clear. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and let me just add to that. I think uh, the responses that you made to uh, Brady's questions uh, were very helpful as well and appreciated. So thank you both for that. Thank you, Dave, for thanking them on my behalf. I would also like to. Thank <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't sure you were going to do it, Brady. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Point taken, Dave. Responses to Brady's questions with those over email. Yes. Yeah, they just came yesterday. Yeah. I probably should send them out to the full OSBT. Brady, oh, right. A few I questions. Made, yeah, sorry. I, I, no, I, I, I was just that. Make, yeah, I would make no, a I do want to jump in. I do want to jump in. I, I agree. Thank you for the for jumping on it really quickly, y'all. And um, and also for offering to, since I'm a newest board member, um, taking me aside and spending 30 minutes to kind of bring me up to speed on things. I, I do think it would just be good to I just have, I always want to reiterate one fundamental question. So when we, when there's an expense that's approved in a given year, it becomes part of base, correct? And then that is effectively the, the presumption is that that is how much we will spend the next year, unless there's a, a citywide reduction in, in costs. Um, and then any change to base comes in as it was presented Today, with you know, we, we're moving some things from CIP in, and we've got a few more FTEs, and we're moving some people from temporary to full time. I understand all that. What I, I think the question I'd like to ask, and just to reiterate, is within base, the staff have a lot of leeway, latitude, to move expenses from one place to another. Is that true? And 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 the what what extent does the board? weigh in on that or not? And, and are we really always just sort of approving additions and, and changes to base and anything that's under base is, is managed in an ongoing manner based on, frankly, the ever increasing priorities that I know that the staff have to manage, but that you all have an, a lot of latitude within that and, and that doesn't really come up for our review. Is that is that a fair statement or would you correct that somehow? I, I would yeah. say that's, oh. go ahead. <laughs> that's no, I was going to say, I thought you were correct yourself. <laughs> um, no, that, that is fairly accurate. There are a few restrictions in the city process. Um, one example would be anything that is an interfund transfer. So, for example, if there was some change in uh, allocation across like climate tax, lottery fund, open space fund, those are things that necessitate um, an adjustment to base and bringing forward. Similarly, we wouldn't be able to move something from standard personnel expense into a non-personnel budget without daylighting that in some way. Um, where you see this happen most um, is in allocations between non-personnel and the non-standard personnel budget, so seasonal and temporary staff allocation. Um, in any given year, so I use trails as an example frequently, we have temporary staff and then we have all these contracted crews, so we have that flexibility based on the work plan to say what's the right skill set match, should we up level our contracted crews or hire more temps and we can make those um, reallocations without uh, bringing those forward. Do we have an <clears throat> internal process to do that? Yes, absolutely. So as part of our work planning process, I think we have about 350 projects for this year in the work plan and we support um, live reporting out of our financial system to all the senior managers and deputy directors. And so every year we get, we call them cubes. Every year, each deputy director is working through the cubes for next year um, and determining, okay, am I going to move one temp position from forestry to ecology? Um, and, and so we would capture all of that in our budget reporting and then upload that as a change to base. But the, because it doesn't change the overall budget allocation, that's not something that would require us to submit a budget request. So internally, very robust work planning process, work plan steering team, the whole director's team is engaged in, in making those decisions. Dan, of course, is as well, Sam and Cole. Uh, but in terms of what comes to the board, we're really looking at broad budget increases to budget, reductions to budget, and then changes across funds or um, expenditure types. Okay, thanks, Lauren. And I know you all I have are gonna, a question. We're going to walk me through this a little bit more in person again. Thank you for that. But yeah, just, of course. Yep. I, I wanted um, to reiterate that. Point. Go ahead, Go ahead. Sorry, the, the delay. Um, I have a question that may or may not be piggybacking off of that one. When we talk about um, complying with the Affordable Care Act, 
the slide was the standard position budget request. I don't know if that what we're shifting to be more in line with the Affordable Care Act. Um, if there were changes in that or, or what we're doing and if that relates to what Lord was saying about standard personnel or um, non personnel budget. Um, I just wanted to know more about that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I Lauren, did you want to or I can take this one? Go for it. Okay, so I'll start and then Lauren jump in if there's anything that um, that I miss on here. So it's a little bit different than what Lauren was just sharing. So uh, we are we are making efforts to um, basically get in compliance with with the Affordable Care Act based on guidance from our HR department. And so you'll see that we are not looking to change headcount necessarily, but we are trying to change uh, positions from non-standard personnel to standard for ongoing work that we have in the department. We're in particular looking to uh, assess our needs over a short period. So for many of our positions, you'll see that we are proposing a two or three fix, three year fixed term um, to see what the need is on an ongoing basis. Um, but for a handful of positions, for instance, we have a, a city planning position um, that has been hired. Uh, we've had the same candidate hired for uh, every year for a 12 month period. Uh, clearly it's an ongoing need for us. So. Um, we're making an effort to convert that now to to a standard ongoing position as part of our base budget. So Sam, does that does that then count as in the FTE count? It does, yeah. So I'm confused because you say, well, there are only two new positions, but in my looking at you know the table, there there are actually I don't know six or or seven or eight. Uh, I think six um, conversions. Yes. And so why why aren't those included then in the FT the department's FTE count? So they will be. Uh, so what I believe you're referring to the personnel table in the document. Yeah, we're going to have that updated with the additional positions in the next memo. Uh, apologies for any confusion. We were showing the base there. Um, this is like our current 2023 budget, and then here's what we're going to be adding to this. Um, so in terms of it's FTE count, you're right, we are adding FTE by converting those positions, not changing head count, but there is a, a cost to that. Right, so the, I don't know, the FTE count, right, for 2023 is like 129 or something mm -hmm. like that. So in 2024, it presumably would be 135 or something. Yep. And right, and right now, there's roughly 200 and something seasonal right. attempts. That right. number will then go down. Right. Will be, be reduced. So if you walked into the office and everyone had a seat, there'd be the same amount of people in right. the office. Right. But technically, the FTE count will will go up, and right. then our seasonal attempt will go down by that number. Right. Okay. And does the Affordable Thank Care Act, as um, for the employer, whether it's the city or OSMP, does it then provide benefits for us to be more in compliant with that so, document? Um, I, I won't speak to the Affordable Care Act side, Lauren. Did you want to speak to that? Or I can just share sure. what we do as a city when they convert to standard? Yeah, so, so the short answer is yes. There are a couple of things that changed um, between the, the Affordable Care Act and then the city's living wage. So um, I'm going back several years now, but we, we primarily employed seasonal positions, which have less than a six month term um, and did not do work comparable to a standard position. Over many years, our business needs changed. And so with the Affordable Care Act, we took the opportunity to use a classification of temporary employee which is not something that we used previously. We we might have had temps, but you're you're talking about more of like a temp staffing agency, something like that. With the onboarding or sort of implementation of Affordable Care Act, we were able to onboard a number of new employment classifications. So temporary 10, 20, 30, 40 hours, interns at 10, 20, 30, 40 hours, variable hour seasonal, regular seasonal. So it really um, expanded the definition and the different employment classifications that we had access to. What the city did with city council is say, if somebody is classified as a temporary employee, we are going to enact a living wage. So by converting those folks, we, we established an artificial minimum pay, which was above minimum wage. It was at 1742 at the time. And then with the Affordable Care Act, um, if somebody is, is considered a temporary employee, they are given health benefits upfront from their first day of service in their first term. The complexity that we're sort of speaking to in the memo 
um, is around the measurement period. So when somebody starts employment as a temporary position here at Open Space, they're automatically given health benefits from the first day of their service for their first year. In their second year of employment, they're looking back at a measurement period to gauge actual hours worked in the previous year to determine what the second year's benefits offerings will be. That's, um, you know, uh, that, that gets very complex because up until the past year, those folks didn't have paid sick time. We're not offering PTO banks or anything like that in that employment classification. So if folks did not have a break in service to reset their measurement period, we were seeing staff losing health benefits as temporary employees in their second year. So the HR definitions um, tell us that a temporary employee can have a term of up to 12 months before their break in service. If we were to enact a 12 month term plus a three month break in service, we would get off cycle with our field seasons, right? So we would be working folks April to January and then not able to bring them back. And so, or, sorry, April to April and then not able to bring them back until after field season. So what we're trying to do is, is stay compliant, keep temp term lanes under a year, uh, but make sure that we're not putting our employees in a position where they're going to lose health benefits in their second year if they come back to us because of our employment arrangement with them. So um, that th those are kind of the fundamental shifts. So th and the difference, I think I said it in the memo, seasonal, unpredictable schedule, less than six months. They're not comparable to a standard position. These temporary positions can be up to 12 months. We would like to keep them to nine months and they can do work similar to a standard employee and they get health benefits up front. So um, the, all of this work continues to evolve. We're now offering sick accruals. We're looking at other changes to um, medical leaves that are that, that will be reviewed by council in a few months, but, but that's sort of the complexity that we're in now, which is the nature of our field season, the expanding needs in the winter. So uh, hence a lot of these position requests that you're seeing. Thank you, that was very helpful as, as always with you. Uh, great. Any further questions? Yeah, I think that actually answers a question that I have, and I um, want to make sure the human dimensions technician, um, it says that it's an ACA uh, request, and then the last sentence said um, that, you know, they would remain temporary with a nine-month term. So nine months, it was nine months, it's still going to be nine months, but by converting them to ACA or, yeah, um, with this classification, it costs more, and that's because of like accruals, basically. Um, the fact that you have to accrue, or is it because of additional benefits? Yeah, I, I, there, for a few of these, we're in this interesting situation of trying to pilot an ACA conversion. So I'm thinking of the outreach rangers, the human dimensions position, the science position, where in the human dimensions program, we have many, many people in human dimensions technician positions. What we're requesting here is that one of those pilot being converted to a multi-year fixed term. So, um, and the, the remainder of the folks in that program would have their term reduced uh, from 12 months to nine months with a clean break in service to be able to come back and ensure that they'll be benefits eligible in the, in the, in the next year. The thinking with the human dimensions technician position I mentioned earlier that with an Affordable Care Act role, a, t a temp term is up to one year. I would say most of our human dimension studies are about 15 months to 18 months. So we've been in this limbo position for human dimensions where we're technically exceeding the term length for a temp, but we haven't hit the term length for a fixed term. We typically don't request a fixed term position that's less than two years. And we've worked with HR every year to say, what is the right thing to do with these positions to meet our business needs? We have a voice and sight study, a resident survey, a POV survey, um, and we're not cleanly fitting into these definitions. And so what we're hoping to do with one of the HD jobs is convert it to a fixed term. And then to make sure we are going to get in compliance with the other jobs, we would be bumping those down to nine months with a three month break in service to get all of the jobs in that, in that job class into compliance with the ACA. Gotcha. So that's a net amount for the, a few positions, not just one. Yeah. Um, other than that, that's all the questions I have. Um, you know, I know this is my third cycle, so I think it's better over time, Brady. Um, so there's, a, there's a lot going on here. It's very complex and we appreciate that the, the members have gotten better and better. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate it. We're looking forward to July when uh, 
the big guns come out and we get to uh, make some calls. <laughs> um, I have one quick thing that's actually not your memo, but it's the attached memo. And I want to let you know that my vigilant and paranoid antennae were vibrating uh, very vigorously when I led that. And here's why. I'm concerned by the section that's titled Dedicated Funding Analysis and Flexibility. And this is the memo uh, from the city manager, the city manager's office to council. And the reason for that is I want, I, I, I'm just concerned about that section of the memo as it relates to the status of the open space fund, because it talks about dedicated funds um, and the flexibility needed in them. And I want to assure staff and the board that uh, dedicated funds, in my experience, have always been viewed uh, longingly by budgeteers and who hate the restrictions on them. And the open space uh, fund has a long history, or the open space board has a long history of protecting the fund from efforts to siphon it into other pots. And so I am I just want to alert you that I'm concerned that that appeared in that memo. And I think it was under the section about the library fund, but when it said dedicated funds and looking at flexibility and all this stuff. What was the attached memo? Sorry. Uh, it's, the atta it's the attached memo to the budget okay. memo. Um, I just want to alert the board uh, and the staff that that's a concern and I think we should be following that very closely. Dave, wasn't that specific to the library district and, and how libraries well, are paid for? Yeah, I think so, but it, it, the language in the section was very general. And so um, I'm just extrapolating from that to other dedicated funds. Oh, okay, what, what, on that point, one last quick question: When, when, when we pass, when, when, when the, the 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 citizens vote to tax themselves for a specific purpose, is that not restricted by definition, and would it not be improper in in the highest degree to use those funds for a different purpose, or is that actually something that is under the purview of the city manager and and, and council? Pretty, I would say that there's a few areas that would sort of define the parameters. One would be the actual ballot language uh, that one could look at to what the voters approved. And you could go back and look at the ballot languages for the open space fund and, and draw parameters out of that. Then you would, then when things enter the open space fund coffers, then you would look at the charter purposes, the open space charter purposes. And then within that, you could open up very specific approved plans for how money's being spent. So there's, I would say there's several layers to what would sort of define parameters around, uh, and I can only speak to the open space fund because that's the one I'm most, most familiar with, but we probably have more enhanced parameters in the open space fund than others, but I can't really speak to, speak to that. But you would start, I think, Brady, to your point with a voter approved you would start with the ballot language itself. Yeah, you're right, Brady. Uh, the first part of your question is correct. All I'm saying is uh, expressing a cautionary note that invariably um, those funds are always viewed as you know attractive to other considerations if uh, their funding needs uh, elsewhere. Okay, and, got it. And so it it's it's kind of how creative can we get, you know, as far as uh, using those funds? And uh, all I'm suggesting is the open space board's purview historically has been very protective of the open space fund used for open space purposes defined in the chart. Okay. And is that, um, I don't know if direction is the right word, but what Dan was saying about looking at the ballot language, is that something that um, you as Mr. Chair I think it would be a good idea for us to do prior to the next meeting to really kind of understand those layers. And uh, I don't have to make a sharp point on it, but um, it, you know, is that is that something we should all get as informed as possible? 
I think it would be useful for the board to know, you know, uh, what those parameters are. And I think, you know, the board depends on staff to, you know, inform us uh, if, if there are some concerns uh, regarding the use of the fund. So, thank you very much. Uh, I think that concludes our budget discussion for tonight. And we are on to, I think, one of my favorite topics because of the title. <laughs> it looks like, Dan, you're going to get enhanced by this next item. So, <laughs> we're, we're all looking forward to it. All right. So what that title actually means, Brady, to your point, is within the operating base budget, are we able to... Uh, uh, look at program areas and put a laser focus on some of them, shift some of our attention around uh, to our focus. So I'd say the answer is yes. Wildfire resilience is a great example. Uh, I think another great example is our prairie dog and agricultural land restoration program. Climate initiatives is another one that in just past few years we've been working and updating the board on those type of enhancements. So there's just a number of program enhancements that we've been doing. Some of them have called out it in the tiering process of the master plan. There's other ones in which the director and the director's team uh, challenges our, our, our team and say, hey, this is maybe over the next year or two or three. Let's, uh, let's see if we could put some more focus on that. And so what, what this means is out of the director's office, we, we challenged our staff, staff uh, I believe starting uh, two years ago, to start taking a look at how can we have enhanced presence in the field? Yes, we could always bring on some employees, which there's examples of some enhanced capacity here with the Ranger team, for instance, but there's also other creative things we could do about having our teams that are out in the field, including volunteers, be more uh, working together, more collaborative in a nature that then re produces that enhanced presence up in the field. So this was sort of a, a director level initiative to our staff saying, hey, let's have some fun with this. Let's see if we could, uh, ways that we could challenge ourselves to see if we could have some more enhanced presence out in the field. And, uh, and so we thought it'd be kind of fun just to report out on some of, the, some of the things we're doing in that area and maybe some of the results. So that's the idea of tonight uh, to take a look at that internal initiative that we have ongoing and I think Dakota you're gonna uh kick things off or Janelle do you want to yeah say I'll just thanks you, thank you you summarize that very well Dan thank you um I will just say a few other things uh, Janelle Freeston interim deputy director for community connections and partnerships and tonight yes Dakota Anderson um who is our new education and outreach not new to the department but new to the role of education and outreach senior program manager will be leading the presentation and then we also have um Burton Stoner, Senior Manager for Ranger Services, and Debbie Cushman, Program Manager for Volunteer Services, to be able to, at the end, help answer questions about this really um, dedicated, strategic, coordinated effort that has been going on since 2022. So um, I will let you take it away, Dakota. Great. Thank you. And are you able to share the presentation? Awesome. Hey, just to make a note, Paul Palmer. Python's that subject. <laughs> I saw it. It wasn't how I wrote how it. How do we correct that? <laughs> a quick comment, y'all. Will, will Paul went to see I'm not even going to comment on that. Brady, Brady, your mic sounds a little um, soft or far away. Okay, well, uh, just, just saying, Will Palmer has been asking questions on the Q&A, and if someone could answer his question. Oh, I'll jump in on those. Thank you, Brady. Yeah, how do we get it up and going? Yes. yes. I can't hear anyway, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Janelle. And thank you, Megan, for figuring out the technical difficulties. Uh, yeah, so as mentioned, my name is Dakota Anderson. I work as our outreach team manager here. And I had a big role in helping to get this presence on the land effort rolling. And so I'm just excited to have opportunity to share this with you tonight. Dan sort of gave a little bit of a summary, but essentially to summarize presence on the land at a high level, in 2022, OSMP had a goal to enhance 
a more strategic and coordinated staff and volunteer presence on the land. And when I say staff and volunteer, I mean uniformed staff and volunteers. We added a, st a staff capacity of five temporary positions for this effort, and this helped to increase our OSMP frontline interactions, especially at a lot of the high visited areas, as well as locations that were experiencing visitate changes in visitation patterns. Next slide, please. So this team has already been pointed out, but this was a quick acknowledgement for the core team that has been working on this. Bert and Debbie and Janelle are all here tonight to help answer questions. Uh, Lisa Jaroff, unfortunately, cannot be here tonight. Next slide, please. So just a quick overview of what I'll be talking about tonight. We are going to go over the goals of this effort, the priority messaging that we came up with for this effort, our 2022 results by each work group, which again are the Rangers Education and Outreach and Volunteer Services as well as plans for 2023 and beyond. And then we will save plenty of time at the end for questions. My part of this presentation is only about 15 minutes. So this will be pretty short and sweet. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the goals for this program were to increase field presence to improve customer service and visibility of staff and volunteers, to create welcoming, inclusive, and enjoyable experiences for our visitors, to encourage responsible recreation, to support resource management efforts and educate on why we manage the lands the way that we do, to provide extra support during emergencies and to increase our safety messaging. So by having this increased capacity to have friendly, trained, uniformed staff and volunteers in the field, we feel we were able to meet every single one of these goals. Next slide, please. This is just an overview of the number of contacts that we were able to make through this effort. Again, throughout the three work groups combined, we were able to make close to 132,000 contacts just in 2022. Next slide, please. A really big part of this for us was coming up with our priority messaging, making sure that we were having weekly and monthly meetings so that we had a shared understanding of what our priority messaging needs to be, again, amongst those three work groups. These are some examples of really the high level of what we're talking about while we're out there. We're providing welcoming and general park information. So this could just include things like trail recommendations or maybe history of OSMP. A really big thing for our teams is talking about safety. What that safety messaging is oftentimes changes based on the season. You could see some examples of that there and see how that can change throughout the year. This is a really big one for our teams, especially on the outreach and volunteer teams, because we feel like we are sort of that preventative and proactive measure. When we can meet people out on the trails and especially meet them at the trailheads before they get out, uh, out onto our system, we can try to prevent a lot of emergencies or rescues or instances from happening. We talk about seasonal closures and restrictions. So these are things like our seasonal raptor closures, for example. One our team really enjoys talking about is recreate responsibly and how to leave no trace. Our team is really excited about this one because we believe the more that we can educate our visitors, connect them to these lands and also teach them how to be stewards and how to be responsible visitors, that's one of the best strategies that we can use when dealing with high visitation. We talk about wildlife interactions and safety. And then I think that last one is also important. We talk a lot about our management techniques and this has been a big focus for us over the past year or two. We find it important to be talking about what is the department doing and why are we doing it? Some examples of this are New Zealand mud snail closures as well as the cattle grazing that's happening on Shanahan for invasive species. Next slide, please. So now we'll dive into each of the different work groups efforts. We'll start off with the Ranger work group. The board was given a pretty comprehensive presentation on the Ranger work group last fall. This presentation will be more focused on that presence on the land effort and their collaborations with us. Next slide, please. And so really what we're taking a look at here are the number of non-law enforcement contacts. So Rangers were able to make just under 27,000 non-law enforcement contacts in 2022. 
a part of this was they were able to add two new temporary positions. So two of those five positions that I was talking about went to the Ranger group here. Our Rangers are obviously trained to enforce OSMP rules and regulations. However, they're also trained to greet visitors, offer information, and to provide assistance. Ranger contacts are entered into the Raptor Patrol application, and each one gets listed under a specific category, which that is what is shown here in this graph that you're seeing. So that of those 27,000 or so contacts, that is the breakdown that you're seeing and what they are talking about. So in 2022, there were 14 commissioned rangers that were primarily field-based. There were also three limited commission temporary rangers. Our temporary rangers that were added, those two positions, unfortunately were not able to finish their terms last year, but we were appreciative of the time that they were able to give. And that was just due to unforeseen uh, circumstances. Temporary rangers work alongside our full-time rangers, but they tend to have more trail presence because they, uh, due to less response to calls. They're not going out on calls and emergencies so much, so they're able to be out on the trails. Uh, a part of this is they were able to connect with our outreach staff a lot, and they were able to get out on the trails and hike together sort of on co-patrols, uh, which helps them keep current on what each work group is doing. And again, keeping that shared messaging going. Next slide, please. Next, we'll talk about our education and outreach team. So for our presence on the land, this is primarily driven by our outreach team. We were also able to add two temporary positions in 2022 to help with this effort. Our outreach team are not commissioned, they are not law enforcement, but they are trained to be out there on the system engaging with the public. And of course they are in uniform. So we do not enforce any rules and regulations, we just inform on rules and regulations. And of course, assist the public in any way that we can. Next slide, please. This is a summary of our contacts that we were able to make in 2022. The outreach team made just under 58,000 contacts in the year. 46,000 of those were coming from trail and trailheads, and around 11,000 of those were coming through the Ranger Cottage. Now, a couple important things to note there about the Ranger Cottage. We only opened in late May due to lingering effects from the COVID pandemic, so we were only open for about half a year. Also, the number that you're seeing there is just staff contacts. We also have volunteers that work inside the Ranger Cottage. So the overall numbers of the Ranger Cottage are actually much higher than what you're seeing that 11,000. I think that third bullet point is really important there as we again think about that proactive and preventative measure that we're able to supply. And that is that 6% of our outreach shifts resulted in calls to 911 dispatch or rangers. So once again, as we think about that preventative measure, our staff are trained to be able to be taking information in from the public and know when, where, and who to call essentially in these emergencies. These graphs are a breakdown of where our contacts were happening. As you can see that graph on the left, the vast majority of our contacts are happening in the Chautauqua area because it gets such a high visitation there and oftentimes a lot of out of town visitor visitation. But I also think it's important to note, you see NCAR, South Mesa, Sanitas on there. We really give a high priority to high, highly visited areas. However, you'll also see that other falls into an 8% category. While we focus on high visitation areas, we also make sure that we get our staff out on every trail within our system. While they're not as highly visited and we don't make quite as many contacts, we find it important that the people that are going to those low visitation areas are recognizing and seeing that there are still uniformed OSMP staff going to those parts of the system. The graph on the right is showing you our average contacts per hour. Again, it shows you why we prioritize these high visitation areas. One quick thing to note there, the way that we were sort of recording these numbers, we did not split up the Chautauqua Trailhead and the Ranger Cottage until pretty late in the year. So that Chautauqua Trailhead number is not completely accurate. It's probably a little bit higher than what 21, uh, if you're wondering why it's so close to NCAR, it's probably closer to something like 23 or 24 contacts per hour. 
Next slide, please. So the last group working on this presence on the land effort are our volunteer services. Volunteer services were able to add one temporary position. So that is the fifth and final position I've been talking about. Our volunteer services related to presence on the land are broken into four categories. We have our Chautauqua ambassadors. They obviously work in the Chautauqua area and also at the Chautauqua Ranger Cottage. Flagstaff Nature Center ambassadors who are working up at the Nature Center, and then our trail ambassadors who are roaming our system, actually getting out on the trails and engaging with visitors there. Next. And then the fourth one is our interagency bike patrol. So these are volunteers that go out on their own bikes and engage with that user group. Next. This is an overall summary of the number of contacts that volunteer services were able to make in 2022 with over 47,000 contacts throughout the year. They were able to do a big recruitment, recruitment for trail ambassadors and also a separate recruitment for visitor ambassadors for both Chautauqua and the Flagstaff Nature Center. And they were also able to increase the number of bike patrollers that were patrolling on city lands. Next slide. This is a graph of where our trail guides or ambassadors are actually getting out on the system and making the majority of their contacts. It's important to note that our trail guides choose where they go on the system. They are not told where to go. So I think it's also a great snapshot of where our locals like to go and shows you that our volunteers are really engaging with our local community. As you can see, the number one trail there is Lion's Lair. This graph is showing a breakdown of the three different volunteer groups and when and where essentially they are making the majority of their contacts. Just pointing out there again, you can see the massive influx of contacts that we make due to high visitation at the Chautauqua area in the summer and fall months. So to talk about where we're at in 2023 and where we plan to go forward with this, we really just plan to continue to align our efforts we are working on having regular check-ins, so weekly and monthly check-ins, not only amongst our core team, but also amongst our field team. Our field team is consisted of a lot of the temporary staff that are actually out there doing a lot of this work. We've had a big, big push this year to really align our scheduling so that we can better understand what work groups are out on the system, when and where. This is incredibly important for emergency situations such as wildfires. We're trying to coordinate more across the department. So getting back to that bullet point about talking about our management techniques, we're trying to work with all of the work groups of the department so we can understand what do they want us to share with the community. This fall, volunteer services will be piloting a dog ambassador program. This is very much still in its beginning phases. However, essentially what that will look like is a volunteer goes out with their well-behaved dog to model positive dog behavior and interactions. And then lastly, we're really pushing to take a more strategic approach at how we're putting our presence to these high, highly visited areas. A lot of that data that we showed you, we are kind of diving deeper into to get a better understanding and take that more strategic approach. I also think it's important to mention a couple of examples that have already happened here in 2023 very recently that shows you the success, the success of presence on the land. One of those being coyote outreach at Teller Farms. We were hearing from our ranger work group, our wildlife team, as well as recreation and stewardship, that there was a lot of coyote activity and we were needing to implement a seasonal leash restriction. So we were able to get volunteers and staff out there multiple days a week to be engaging with the community, talking to them about coyotes, the activity, and what to do in the scenario of walking by these coyotes. Another example that's currently happening right now where this we found this to be very successful uh, is aggressive cattle on the Shanahan area. We received a lot of reports of aggressive cattle and within hours of receiving those reports, we were able to have outreach staff and volunteers out there at Shanahan and have ha had them out there almost on a daily basis. And we find this really important so that we can uh, we're able to not only keep our community safe, but we are also able to promote the program, teach people why that program is so important. So hopefully that we can continue to have that program for years to come. Next slide, please. So that wraps things up. I'd love to open it up for questions. Again, I have a team here to help answer these questions, um, but we also have a question for you. And that is, are there any enhancements you would like the presence on the land team to explore in 2023? And 
beyond. Great, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, helpful and instructive. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, any board members have questions uh, that they'd like to ask? Um, I don't have a question. I will answer the question that you guys um, had. It just popped into my head. I don't know um, if it will be helpful or not, but thank you for your presentation. It, it felt like you worked really hard on that and you did a really great job. So thank you thank for you. Um, organizing that in such a good way. Um, it made me think of it because Dan said um, for having people out on the property are, are uniformed rangers. And since we have so many volunteers in so many different ways. After hearing him say that, um, obviously it's so helpful if you're having like a health emergency and you see a uniform walk by, you're going to say something more than someone else where um, you might not know that, that they are there to help. So I was <laughs> looking at your outfits and I was like, wouldn't it be neat if we had like a, and I'm making up this name, but like a Ranger green color shirt that all of the volunteers can wear, um, whether it's necessary for all of their positions. But over time, our system will start to associate that color with someone who is there, um, you know, for the benefit of open space if they, um, you know, need that for for any reason. So um, I just like the green. Yeah. Have, every, have everyone <laughs> yeah. in the green. So our volunteers. Uh, wear a khaki colored shirt similar to this. Um, so it hopefully shows people that they uh, are like in an official capacity. We've actually kind of run into problems. It's gotten tricky with having our volunteers look too much like staff um, because our volunteers are not quite trained to the level that our staff are. It's morphed into what they want to be. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so, but the uniform conversation has been a big one. Uh, and Debbie, I don't know if you want to add anything to what our volunteers specifically are wearing. Fashion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's my job here. Fashion. I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Caroline. Uh, yeah, we, um, we've been going around, Janelle and I have been working a lot on this over the last couple of years, um, and with the Ranger group. We found during the pandemic and um, about that time, it, it, we prefer to actually have our volunteers back in green t-shirts on the land. Uh, and so some of our volunteers are still out there. So our trail ambassadors are patrolling in green t-shirts right now. And our ambassadors who work at the visitor centers wear a khaki shirt that does look a lot more. I'm happy to show you one of those as well. Um, looks a lot more like a ranger shirt. We just asked them actually not to wear their green pants <laughs> because we were worried they'd look too much like the ranger. So this is this is an ongoing conversation yeah. we have with all of you. Because if you said wear green, obviously there's um, variety in that rainbow, but maybe everyone that is doing it is just naturally drawn to more of the ranger green that we see. Thank you, Rexy. Thank you, the ranger green. Thank you, Steve. So um, I'd say more to come on that, and yeah, I, I will get some board input on what y'all might want to see out there and, and how we look professional, yet keep our volunteers safe, since they, like Dakota said, don't have the training that our staff do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So I'd like to ask you about the, the data uh, collection and kind of uh, how how you are tracking you know the various elements or components um, and part of my question is also obviously the department does a lot of you know monitoring you know separate from uh, your efforts so how do you integrate you know that information that you know from some of the monitoring efforts that are you know not your data collection efforts into you know your work program and things and I guess uh, Burton you and I have talked about the Raptor um, database and so I'm interested in kind of hearing you know as far as the use is that database up and running and you know and useful or are we still trying to you know kind of troubleshoot it and uh, work through that so I guess you know, if you can uh, just take a couple minutes and say, you know, kind of how you're integrating, you know, the information collection effort, both on your efforts as well as elsewhere in the department, 
which might help guide your efforts. Do you want to start with Raptor? Or? Sure, I can jump in real quick. My camera's not working on my laptop, so I'll just stick my head in the screen here. How's that? Um, <laughs> I can Burns see. Owner, range <laughs> manager, and Kai. Um, so Raptor is up and running. It's a phone-based app um, that we're able to, to collect that information from. So the, the graph that you saw displayed earlier are the four main buckets that we kind of put all of our contacts into. So they just we fit them into that. It's worked well. Um, it's a simple and, and um, meaningful way to, to track it. So at the end of our patrol, we'll just log in, drop in how many contacts we made in those while we're out. Um, at that in that time frame there's and it's a slightly different version of, of how outreach is collecting it um but again it's it gets at um lots of different kinds of contacts that are made right, right. so advising on um, conditions could be if there's a trail closure if there's other things that are impacting what we think visitors will experience in an area you know then we'll but that's kind of where that stuff fits so so the Raptor database is working well or relatively it is. well. Yes, it is. And what it's it's built to allow for law enforcement contacts as right. well. So that's one of those distinctions, right? That's why rangers are using it. It allows us to when we have to have to make an enforcement contact, we can track it that way too. Oh, yeah. And after you make a contact, I'm sorry. Oh. No, no, it was quick. After you make a contact, um, if you speak with four people about a closure and then leave, do you count that as four contacts or one? We would count that as four. Okay. I, I think I think that makes sense. But yeah. yeah. So then uh, as far as you, the other work group? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, we all use kind of a different system. <laughs> um, you know, so the Raptor database that's really built for uh, law enforcement patrols and um, and you know, they kind of need to dive more into their different, like, did they have a, a law enforcement or non-law enforcement contact? Uh, for us, we use essentially an online form. Uh, and so at the end of every shift, and a shift could be in, like an eight-hour day at the Chautauqua Ranger Cottage, or a shift could be a, a two-hour hike up Flagstaff. So staff could have anywhere between one or three really shifts a day. Uh, at the end of every shift, our staff go on to this online form and they fill out where they were, how many hours they worked, how many contacts they made, things like that. One of the questions on there is, did you have to call 911, a dispatch or a ranger? And so that's where we're able to really pull that data from. And, and they also add in like interesting bullets from the day or, or why they were calling 911 or a ranger. So we're able to go back and look at all of that data. And essentially we just get an Excel file that we, we run the data ourselves for that. Um, for us, we do the same. We count as many people that are there as a contact. And a contact for us is either a friendly conversation or an exchange of information. So if I ask somebody if they know where they're heading that day and we you know, exchange a few sentences, that's a contact. If I just wave at somebody and say hello, that's not a contact. So that is how we have determined how to make um, these contacts. And it's, it's pretty, to answer your question with human dimensions, um, we have, our education team has worked with human dimensions a bit. We have not quite dived into that yet. Uh, I think that will be a part of sort of that strategic plan. So I'm, I'm hearing you there. Uh, and as well as our online, we don't have a ton of history in terms of the amount of data that we're tracking right now um, because that online form was a COVID sort of need. Uh, so it's relatively new and it's honestly been changing a lot as we try to work out uh, all the details and kinks in the system. There. But so, Dave, you raise a really good point about now we're getting all these robust data sets, then how do we look at right. distinct ones that have some commonality to it? For instance, what is the peak visitation hour at the South Mesa Trailhead? Hmm, hmm. let's look at where oh, we're only spending 33% of our South Mesa Trail. Let's enhance that to 10% and have it be at these peak hours at the trailhead. That's when we can take visitation data that's being collected, overlay it with that data and make some strategic changes to it. So. That's, I think that's what you're referring to is that strategic look at how we're using things. Exactly. Various data can all be integrated together to kind of help us make some changes right. and enhancements. Exactly. That That is hopefully the plan going into the future. Uh, as of recent, it's just been anecdotal. We know NCAR is busy. We know Sanitas is busy and packed with uh, locals. And so it, it's been mostly anecdotal, but the goal is to make it more strategic. 
you know, my experience um, is actually with the raptor monitoring effort and what I'm thinking is, you know, the information that volunteers collect, uh, you know, while they're monitoring raptors, you know, if they, if they encounter something or, you know, that they have a concern, does that get uh, transmitted to, you know, the ranger group or the, the outreach group or, you know, how are, the, how are those kind of information uh, elements uh, integrated? Was that a contact with a raptor or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you had contacted a raptor, you're probably not going to worry about that. I can, I can jump, jump in, in, Dave, and answer that right. real quick. Um, I work I with the raptor volunteers and bat and volunteers. And and bat volunteers. Right. And so, so I get to see their reports when they come in. So, so I can see their that's my microphone. Nothing should have changed here. Yeah, what happened? Yeah, I joined recently. Um, try again. again. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't happen when I walked in. Is your microphone muted? Yeah, I just did that. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I do see, not only do I see all the raptor and bat monitor reports, they come in through a form stack. And so they go to the biologist and the field techs. So there's probably about four or five of us who are looking at every one of those reports. So I guess historically, we don't get a lot of other data from them. They're very focused on their jobs, <laughs> but they also know they can send me anything. So I will sometimes get an email from a Raptor volunteer, you know, the next day and say, hey, turn in my report and saw a problem out here. Again, it doesn't happen often. It's usually more of a maintenance issue or a concern about a trail. And then does that get science. conveyed? Uh, oh, absolutely. Elsewhere or wherever it oh, needs to? Yeah, so um, so that's how it happens with those volunteers. It happens differently with all our volunteers. The trail ambassadors who are out there on a regular basis, they, when they're finished their shift, when they go into Count Me In, Boulder, our big volunteer citywide system, they put in their end of the shift report. So that's where we're getting the numbers of how many people they contacted. We even get the numbers of what they dog contacts, education contacts, first day trail advice. And then they have a section to put in any other comments to put a maintenance report in that goes to us. And then we kind of figure out who needs to see that. Is it trailheads that needs the maintenance report? Is it the trails team? Great. Um, yeah, super, super great. My temp crew lead chance is checking those um, once or twice a week and getting information out. Bike patrol ones come to me and chance as well. Janelle picks up on them once in a while too. Yeah, we've got a pretty pretty good system. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, Burton, can you clarify this sentence for me? Um, law enforcement oriented contacts are captured in the Raptor system. Um, however, law enforcement contacts are not counted in the uh, totals. So yeah, can you just clarify that? Sure, absolutely. So what we're trying to get at was all of the other kinds of contacts that rangers make outside of a law enforcement contact. So if we gave a warning or ended up in a ticket, we're not counting those as presence on the land numbers because we're looking at more of the outreach side of, of the kinds of contacts that we're making with the public. So it's in the Raptor database, but you're not including them in the POTL. That's correct. So that 27,000 I talked about also going into that 132,000 are not including law enforcement contacts. Okay. And um, are all rangers now wearing body cams? So the, at all the time? Yes, we are. At all times? Yes. Okay. Take a picture of us now? It's <laughs> technically <laughs> yes, but it's not actually on. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's good. A <laughs> uh, couple other questions. Um, when you, you mentioned safety um, on the in, in this initiative, are, are you also catching people on the front end to make sure they have enough water on a really hot day and yes. knowing that there's not water out no, there? That's probably what we, one of the things we talk about the most. Um, if you ever want to come spend a day at Chautauqua with us, you will be amazed at, you know, how many people we convince to not do the Royal Arch Trail uh, because of a variety of reasons. The amount of people we send back to their cars to grab water bottles or to the, you know, somewhere to get water. Um, 
absolutely. It, it's one of our, it, we ask that question to pretty much every single visitor that, that talks to us. So I'm getting by because I feel like they're passing out up there. Yeah. Um, and then the other, the, on the statistics of the mountain bike ambassadors, it looked like, and it was really, you went through it really fast. <laughs> Um, the contacts per hour were significantly lower for them. And I'm just wondering if that's a tra tracking issue or a training issue I'd, or I'd both. Say it's neither, actually. It's that they don't stop and make contacts like our trail ambassadors do. So the trail ambassadors, right, they're walking by everybody. They will pretty much, we just ask them to greet everybody. I was out with some yesterday out on Shanahan doing cow outreach. And... Um, you know, we stop and say hi to everybody walking by us. And if we have a, you know, if they want to stop and talk more, great. If they have a dog, we're going to talk a little bit more. Like, hey, do you know the cows are out? We've been out here before. Is your leash handy? Our bike patrol isn't stopping and making contacts with everybody. They're, you know, if they see a problem on the trail, they're going to stop and check in. If they see a conflict, they'll stop. Um, but they're not, they're, they're bike riding. <laughs> I ride with them once in a while too. And so they're riding. And, and they're modeling. Modeling good things, you know, modeling good behavior on a bike, you know, whether that's letting, you know, uphill users go by. Maybe, you know, if they see a really egregious moment, they might stop and coach another bike rider. Like, hey, I saw you just pass that, you know, those hikers very closely. That, that was probably very scary for them, you know, you really need to be respectful that I have the right way. Just just a reminder, have a great day and carry on. But it's not, I, don't, I guess, is regular. And, and it's something we could address too, if we feel like we want them to be doing a little more outreach, what we're- It seems like we could. I'm just, you know, I, I've had really good interactions with them okay. um, before. It's been a while, but uh -huh. I've had good interactions with them, but it seems like there's more opportunity there. Okay. And I, I don't I like know that. if- um, if those particular folks feel comfortable with, with maybe with a little bit more training, yeah. um, where are opportunities, I mean, uh, that, that they could offer more mentorship. Sure. Are the mountain bike ambassadors on mountain bikes or are yes. they on foot? They're on bikes. Okay. Yeah. And they're also, we have a few now who are patrolling on the our flatter Eastern trails on maybe not on a mountain bike. They might be like on a hybrid or, a, you know, uh, we have a, a bike, a new bike patrol who's out on a trike. He's an older gentleman and lots of people stop and ask him about that, which is great. He's making more contacts than anyone else. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what they need. Right? Yeah, nice. yeah. Yeah. So that's been fun. We're also doing some trail head, more trailhead outreach with bike mm -hmm. patrol. So actually this Saturday we'll be out at uh, Marshall Mesa and next Saturday morning at Dowdy, we're out with the Horsemen's Association. So we've been partnering with them, so we'll get more contacts there. Um, honestly, with e-bikes rolling out July 1st, um, we'll get out. Thank wow. you. I just talked to Wendy Sweet today. So we'll start All right. doing some more. We could set up a tent over at that Boulder Valley Ranch and just have like an education day, like this is a no-go. Yep. If yeah. On an e-bike, this is a no-go. I, I think that there's some opportunity there. Yeah, okay. Um, and then I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I know, hopefully Karen is watching this, but um, uh, the, the dog ambassador pilot program um, is, uh, I'll just be eager to hear more about that. And, and hopefully you're partnering some other local organizations here, like Fido's or some of the, the pet shops or um, to just to kind of help staff that. I can tell you what we're going to, we're going to go a little slow. We're going to start with more of like a pilot program. Uh, and learn as we go. Obviously, we will reach out to Jefferson County and some of the other groups that have established dog ambassador programs. Obviously, trying to make it our own and what's going to work here and, and try a little pilot and learn and adapt. Yeah. And something we didn't mention, um, dogs will be on leash. So, that'll, so they will not be off leash. They'll be on leash. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. And it was very helpful. Right. So we'll look forward to seeing all you guys out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah please Thank join it. Really, join a shift. Yeah. Reach out. Yeah. Right. Happy yeah. to have you come join any of these. We will do that. Yes. So uh, we're going to give you guys uh, five minutes to get squared away. And so we'll take a quick break and come back. Why don't we come back at uh, 845?
and looking forward to this conversation for sure. All right. Well, we hope, um, Sorry, are we all set? Uh, we hope we uh, set this conversation up fairly well with last month's memo, uh, our field trip, which was quite an adventure. We lost a vehicle, recovered a vehicle, and then had a great conversation. Um, and then today's memo, and of course, this is leading up to some final uh, staff recommendations in July, in which we are looking forward to getting boards uh, uh, deliberations on uh, what we are uh, coming up with, with an assessment that we've been conducting uh, since uh, well, over the last four or five months of looking at our prairie dog uh, alternative uh, plan that was passed in 2020. So with that, I believe, am I going to turn things over to Heather Swanson, our interim deputy director of resource stewardship? Thank you, Dan get our presentation up and hopefully it will mm -hmm. <laughs> As Dan said, I'm the um, interim deputy director for resource and stewardship. And I'm just gonna start us out here and um, give a little bit of background and sort of set the stage. And then I'm gonna be turning it over to um, Andy Pelster and Tori Poulton to go through the meat of the presentation and I'll let them introduce themselves when we get to them, but um, they'll be doing the heavy lifting. So a little bit of um, background on the, the project that we are reviewing. So the city of Boulder and op Open Space and Mountain Parks has a long history of um, planning and management related to prairie dogs on open space. And although prairie dog planning goes all the way back to the Black-tailed Prairie Dog Management Plan um, back in, I believe it was 1996, more recently, um, the, the city has a wildlife protection ordinance and that is really an effort to um, minimize lethal control of wildlife, in particular prairie dogs, as well as um, birds. And so all of our planning is within the framework of the wildlife protection ordinance. And so that, that real pillar of minimizing lethal control is important as we're making plans for, for minimizing prairie dog conflict. In 2010, um, the department completed the Grassland Ecosystem Management Plan, and that was really an update to that 1996 prairie dog plan to bring prairie dog management into the context of the overall grassland ecosystem uh, management on open space and mountain parks. And so that plan um, contained a comprehensive management plan for prairie dogs, as well as all of the other natural ecosystems in the grasslands and our agricultural um, production goals. And then in 2017, we completed the Agricultural Management Plan, which um, pulled some of those elements of uh, agriculture out of the Grassland Ecosystem Management Plan and further developed them and further developed um, goals for our agricultural program. And in 2018, uh, we brought together a community working group, the Prairie Dog Working Group that was made up of a variety of community member volunteers, as well as staff. Um, and largely those recommendations, which were accepted by the city manager and city council um, were, were focused largely on prairie dog conservation. Mm -hmm. Although they did speak a little bit to the conflict with um, agriculture. And then in 2019, the department completed our master plan and the master plan does include um, both strategies for um, conservation of native ecosystems, as well as reducing conflict between um, prairie dogs and irrigated agriculture. And so on the heels of, of the master plan, um, staff worked with the board um, and the community to come up with what at the time was called the preferred alternative um, for the management of prairie dogs and irrigated agricultural land. And that, that was recommended by the board and then accepted by council in 2020. And so the context of our prairie dog conflict often brings up questions about our prairie dog conservation and how those two things are happening simultaneously. So we won't talk a lot more about this tonight. A lot of um, Tori's main focus is prairie dog conservation and management, and she has a robust program focused on that. Um, and so these are just some of our grassland plan indicators related to prairie dog conservation. So what you see on the left is the indicator, then the objective of where we want to be on that indicator, um, what the status was in 2020 when we were um, establishing this program, and then what the current status is. Um, so basically we want to see that 
70% or more of our prairie dogs are occurring in places where we want prairie dogs, which is grassland preserves, prairie dog conservation areas, and multiple objective areas. In 2020, we were not meeting that threshold. Now in 2023, with our 2022 mapping, we are meeting that threshold and we're, in, um, we're good for that. Um, we're in the good category for that, for that indicator, which is why it's green. There are two different numbers there, and this is kind of a fine point. We do have irrigated agriculture within grassland preserves. So there are places within grassland preserves that are still conflict areas. So that 76% is if you remove those acres and don't, don't consider them to be in protected status. So even with that, we're still um, in a good status as far as where the prairie dogs on our system are occurring um, from a conservation perspective. Um, looking at our grassland preserves, and Tori will speak a little bit more about this later, um, we'd like to see all three within our objectives, which is 10 to 20, 20%, percent, 26% occupancy. We con currently only have one that's within that range, which is our southern grassland preserves. The other two are above that 26% occupancy. And then we look at the extent overall of colonies just within the grassland area, which is essentially within the segment of the OFSMP system that is prairie dog. Um, habitat. And you can see the top end of our objectives for that is 3,137 acres system-wide. We're now at 5,196. So we're in a fair category, but it's because we're actually over on the number of prey dogs that we have, not under. So I just put those up there to show we're meeting or exceeding our, con our conservation goals for prairie dogs. And in most cases um, are looking at some of the issues that having far more prairie dogs than our objective is where that may cause problems. Next slide. So coming back now to the focus of tonight's conversation, um, our management of prairie dogs on irrigated agricultural lands. Um, as I said, council took action um, in September of 2020. And a few of the, the kind of important points of what they did are that, that as part of that process, they um, had a finding that irrigated agriculture was a public improvement project. And that's important because that is one of the situations in which uh, the Wildlife Protection Ordinance will allow for a special permit to be um, issued for lethal control. So one thing that this does mean is that our, our project, however we might modify it, is focused on irrigated agricultural lands. Um, there was a special permit then issued for lethal control and capture of prairie dogs and for the borough damage and destruction exemptions within this northern project area. And as I said, it was only irrigable lands in the northern project area. It did have this geographic um, restriction. Next slide. So some of the components of um, the project were the idea that irrigated agriculture is the best opportunity for agriculture on OSMP and some of our most valuable agricultural lands. And that reducing conflict with prey dogs on these lands um, war was warranted to use lethal control. Um, so we would undertake the removal on irrigated OSMP lands within the Northern Project area. And Andy's gonna talk about the progress we've made on that in a minute. Um, the direction was to do annually up to 40 acres of relocation between 100 to 200 acres of lethal control to use barriers to discourage recolonization, thus reducing the need for ongoing lethal control, to undertake restoration following removal to bring the properties back into irrigated agricultural production, and to use coexistence and experiment with coexistence where removal hadn't, hadn't happen, happened yet to help control weeds, improve or maintain vegetative cover, improve soil health and prevent erosion. And so the overall goals of the project were to reduce the conflict between prairie dogs and irrigated agriculture, reduce the impact to individual agricultural lessees within that Northern project area, increase the number of properties that are leased for irrigated agriculture on OSMP, increase the acreage of irrigated agriculture and production and improve soil health and reduce, reduce erosion and weed infestation on those properties. So now I'm gonna, Hand it over to Andy Pelster, our senior manager for agriculture and water resources management. <laughs> and Thanks, I didn't Heather. get that right. I have so. a long title. <laughs> uh, good to be here again. Um, a little better weather condition inside here than our last meeting. But um, so as Heather mentioned, I'll kind of start off with project 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 progress so far. I'll share some thoughts on what we've learned and kind of go through some of the recommendations. I do want to apologize to folks on the call. My camera, for some reason, is not working. Um, 
So you'll, you'll hear my voice talking, but you won't see my face on camera. Um, so 2023 really will be the third year of full implementation. The council didn't approve these recommendations till August of 2020. Um, so this will be a third full season. Um, with that, we have removed 348 acres of prairie dogs from irrigable land in the project area. Um, and we're also making some progress on restoration in the project area. Um, as far as how we have done removal, we've done 132 acres of relocation and then 216 acres of lethal control. Uh, as far as the <clears throat> restoration is concerned, we have 72 acres that we would consider fully um, you know, fully restored and back into agricultural production. We have 92 acres that are in some process um, and we will start on the more than 100 acres that we did remove along last year or we have started in this growing season. Most of the progress in the project area has been made on the Axelson Johnson lease area, which is in the, you know, the 55th and Monarch uh, region of the Northern project area. Um, although we have worked on multiple lease areas and, and provided some benefit to, I think, uh, four different tenants up in the project area. Um, we have reduced the conflict on the Axelson Johnson area uh, as an example from 47% occupation to 20% occupation. So a nice reduction for uh, Dwayne and Luke on their group of properties. Um, work in 2023 will continue on this complex. We also have some work planned on Boulder Valley Ranch and on the Brubaker Stratton complex. So that's what's going on in 2023. Um, another big achievement is uh, removal from the Oasis property. Um, that was one of our largest unleased properties. So we undertook removal there um, and it will take us multiple years to get that into a lease condition. Uh, good progress on some unleased parcels also in the lease or project area. Uh, next, please. Frozen on the screen and is working on the Zoom. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we had a really good streak going there. <laughs> so, we all have um, our individual screens up here. Yeah, yeah, we can keep going. going. Sure. I'll, I'll take a minute and review the lease impacts using our 2018 Prairie Dog mapping data and our 2022 mapping data. Um, Really, this isn't to get into the details of each lease area, but I think there's a few important points that can be made in looking at the table. Um, it does show the comparison by the lease area and then also by the irrigated land on each, each lease area. Um, the green numbers show where there's been a decrease in the number of acres of prairie dogs and the red numbers show where there's an increase. There are a couple of orange numbers, which means they stayed the same. Um, but in, in kind of taking a, a broad view of conditions, um, we did see some minor expansion in non-irrigated areas in the northern project area, but overall our removal of efforts have been successful in reducing the amount of conflict in the project area, um, you know, which, is, which is great to see. Um, leaseholds. So Andy, um, removal means either lethal control or relocation. Yes, yes. When I say removal, I'm talking about both types of right. Yes. Um, and, and also looking at it, I did separate the leaseholds that were outside the project area. Um, they have experienced uh, prairie dog expansion in both the non-irrigated context and on irrigated land. Uh, but we should also point out that some of our relocation efforts from the north to the southern grasslands, of course, contributes to that number in the non-irrigated context um, in that particular situation. And if we look at that lower set of properties that are unleased, um, removal efforts on Gallagher and Oasis in particular have you know, shown some progress there. Um, Gallagher's not in that table, but um, certainly is bringing conflict down in, in the unleased situations. And we can also see that by managing the properties and implementing some coexistence strategies, whether that's irrigation seeding, key line plowing, we're seeing some shrinking you know, on a, on a marginal basis. It's not, I wouldn't call it highly successful, but, you know, we are at, at a minimum, I think, improving conditions on the properties that we're implementing work on. Uh, so uh, what have we learned that, uh, you know, I think 
many of us here know that prairie dog removal at this scale really hasn't been attempted by open space. And so uh, we're implementing at, at this scale for the first time. You know, overall, we do believe the program has been pretty successful. Um, and there are some aspects of the program that, that don't need to be changed, but uh, we did also learn a few things that we would like to make some changes. Uh, you know, going into the project, I think we, we obviously knew that the properties are all complex. Uh, some are more complex than others, and each property presents its own set of challenges and opportunities. Um, you know, a raptor nesting site might show up on a property for a certain number of years. Um, the colony may be, you know, an adjacent colony may be dependent on that raptor nesting site. Or the nesting site may be dependent on the prairie dog colony. Um, or, you know, I think we suspected or we may find that a management decision much earlier or some change to the irrigation infrastructure really makes it physically impossible to deliver irrigation water to a property that we might consider historically irrigated. Um, and that's somewhat common, you know, a, a development, for example, might interrupt an irrigation lateral from the main ditch to a property. Um, and we would show that as historically irrigated, but we can no longer get water there without a huge investment. Um, and I think if we step back and take a system wide view, we can also, you know, there may be higher quality irrigated land or better opportunities outside of the northern project area. Um, and we'll have some recommendations about that. But initially, as you know, we did use pretty much contracted services for all of the perk and follow up. Uh, we, we do now feel more confident in managing this work in house and believe that will lead to some cost savings and add capacity to the program uh, moving forward. We'll have a recommendation there. And um, not, I don't think it's super surprising, but you know, I, it was a little bit surprising to find how much maintenance and improvement on the irrigation infrastructure that has been required to do restoration on the properties. Um, so we have some suggestions there. And uh, you know, management actions that were taking barrier placement irrigation water allocation, allocations, irrigation infrastructure, all of these things may in fact change some of the interpre interpretation of the grassland, the GMAP colony designation criteria. Uh, so we'll discuss that a little further also. Um, the barriers are working as we anticipated. Um, and also the, you know, the annual meeting I think has been an effective communication tool uh, to, to talk about what has happened and what we're proposing moving forward. Next, please. Um, and again, we, we are proposing some changes, but uh, some things are working well and we're not proposing any change to, we're not suggesting changes to the overall goals of the project that Heather discussed. Um, you know, we certainly want to keep reducing irrigated land prairie dot conflict and, and the multiple of, uh, goals that Heather discussed earlier. Um, we're also suggesting that we continue pretty much at the current pace of removals. Um, there's a lot of moving parts where, where we are doing the barrier, we're removing prairie dogs, we're doing restoration, and we're doing this also while balancing all the other uh, work plan items, lease management on the rest of the system. So we believe that the current pace best balances our commitment to other work plan items while making good progress on this particular project. Um, we will also continue to prioritize properties for removal on an annual basis using the original uh, prioritization criteria in the preferred alternative. And we'll hold that annual meeting to communicate that, the progress and future plans. Uh, again, we do believe barriers are effective, so we'll continue with minor changes to that part of the program. Uh, one thing I think that has been really nice is um, restoration work and collaboration with the tenants has been pretty successful, um, particularly on the light to moderately impacted properties. You know, general agricultural practices that they're helping us with have been getting those properties back into production. Um, and I mentioned that we 
the mapping indicates that some of our property management activities, some of it's experimental, but things like cover cropping, seeding, irrigation, key line plowing have been effective and we're gonna continue to do that at, at the largest scale we can given our staffing uh, capability to do so. Next, please. So in the next few minutes, I'll talk about some of the recommend, recommended changes. We'll talk about the various property categories. Uh, we'll talk about our recommendation to um, expand the project to all irrigated transition and removal areas. Uh, we'll talk about modifying the rule for borough disturbance. Um, we'll review the staffing proposal and uh, talk a little bit about infrastructure um, improvements, um, maintenance designations, and Tori then we'll move into some relocation recommendations and Heather will wrap up with um, kind of next steps. Can I ask a quick question? How much of the, this was all in the packet, correct? Or, or is there some new information here? Uh, it should all be in the packet. Some of the background would have been in the May packet, but most of this was, was in this current packet. Yeah. <clears throat> What's the are the categories? They're a, they're an appendix, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about that table that with the really small numbers? <laughs> was, yeah. was oh, that that, that was not in the packet. Okay. That table was not in yeah. the packet. If we could get that, I think. Sure. Helpful. I couldn't read that. Yep. And we can certainly go back to any slide too and yep. try to zoom in. <laughs> well, no, I was more my more my point was that you can presume that we've all read the packet. Uh, I think. Um, but carry on, thank you. Oh, sorry, I lost my place. In the, um, I do want to spend some time and talk about the, uh, you know, we we have grouped these properties into um, <laughs> into a group of or into categories, and really we were hoping to better communicate the challenges and opportunities that might be presented because of the site conditions on each property. Um, and, you know, it's really important to note that the categories don't represent any particular priority. And, you know, a property can move between categories depending on if the site conditions dictate movement to do so. Um, and, you know, we aren't really recommending to move through the categories from A to D in any particular order and would anticipate selecting properties from multiple categories in a particular year. Um, you know, I think one of the public speakers mentioned it's a good planning tool and that's exactly one thing, one way to think about it. It's a planning tool and it's, it really was an effort in transparency by us to show um, challenges and opportunities. So, um, you know, we will continue to use the original prioritization criteria to make our annual work plans. Andy, I think there's been some confusion in the public on, you know, the, the uh, purpose of this and kind of the implementation of it. So I think uh, that's good clarification. And the other thing I think is once we kind of get one effort underway, people can see, you know, okay, here's how that actually is going to work. So um, hopefully uh, once we can get moving ahead on it, uh, it'll become clearer to um, everyone on how, how we're going to be using it. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think the, um, you know, it's somewhat obvious that, you know, the A to D, they go from uh, least complex to more complex. We probably don't need to move too much into that. I, I do have a couple of examples, though. Um, you know, rather than spend time reading what the category descriptions are, I can talk a little bit about what a, what a B means to me or a B or a C. Um, you know, the A's are straightforward. Uh, some of the proper uh, colonies on Boulder Valley Ranch, we have them in category B. You know, these are embedded within a grassland preserve. It's a highly recreated property, which presents some challenges for how do you put barriers um, and keep them, you know, uh, have all the ped gates. How do, you, how do you work a barrier system around that? And because it's embedded, it just makes it a little more complex to think about. Um, so that's an example of a category B. Um, a category C might be the Brubaker, and they are the Brubaker and Stratton. Those are examples. One is, uh, you know, an ecological, um, you know, there's a nest site up there that we, we have an interest in preserving um, prairie dogs within some uh, radius of. So if that 
nest site were to move or become not successful at some point, then we would reevaluate, you know, that change, that ecological change would cause us to reevaluate that site condition. And then uh, Stratton Southwest, uh, we are working on improving the irrigation system. When we feel confident that we can deliver enough water to, to uh, restore that property, we will reevaluate that site condition and, and consider uh, moving it into a different property category or for actual removal. Um, and then I guess one example of a category D is the IBM South property. Um, when we undertook removal there, we worked with the tenant to talk about how much of that property do you feel comfortable irrigating with the allocated water rights? And we did a walkthrough with the tenant. We placed the barrier appropriately uh, based on that conversation. Um, and so that barrier now makes it very difficult to irrigate anything on the downside of the barrier. And couple that with some of the terrain, um, you know, we just felt that we wanted to put the irrigate, limited irrigation water to the best parts of the property. And because of that, that some of the areas south of the barrier may, be, may have potential for a, a redesignation. Um, I, th I think others have noted uh, in that many of the category A properties are located outside of the project area boundaries. Um, you know, it's our opinion that these locations do provide very good opportunities to reduce conflict and restore agricultural activity quickly and really at probably, you know, at the least cost. Um, and, and it could be, or it is likely that some of these locations have higher quality soil um, than some areas that were proposing in the in the northern project area or may have more uh, senior water rights. Um, so there's those factors to think about also. And you know, as we suspected, um, we have we know and have confirmed that these areas of conflict that may be more isolated um, are easier and and more cost effective to remove than you know a large colony that's embedded within a larger you know, landscape context full of prairie dogs. Um, because of some of these, we are recommending that we expand the project area to include all irrigated and transmission transition areas system wide. Um, you know, we're certainly not proposing to abandon work in the northern project area. We just simply recognize we have an opportunity to reduce conflict where it's most con uh, most cost effective. You know, we can provide support to our tenants outside the project area. And you know we certainly want to prevent this widespread irrigated, widespread occupation of irrigated land that we have in the north by trying to take action earlier uh, elsewhere on the system. Next, please. Um, so we mentioned earlier that we use the rulemaking process to make it possible for tenants to <clears throat> borrow disturbance uh, as part of our 2020 recommendations. Uh, there was a lot of debate on staff at the time, and but we chose to take a very conservative approach to because we, we recognized we could use adaptive management and, and make another recommendation in the future. Um, we are finding that the three inch limit, you know, probably was a little bit conservative. Uh, practices like key line plowing, for example, are, you know, aren't effective at that depth. Um, so, um, and, you know, honestly, there hasn't been real widespread adoption of it by the tenants. You know, part of it may be because they didn't feel like the three inch limit was going to be effective at doing anything. Um, so because of these factors, we are recommending to use the rulemaking process again to allow that six inches of disturbance system wide. Um, but also allow for 12 inches of disturbance with appropriate notice um, as in the, the current rule. So can key line plowing uh, be effective at six inches? It can, it, uh, the three inch, it, obviously the deeper you go, the more effective it is. Um, if we can get below, um, you know, the thickest sod, the six inches, it seems to have been effective in you know, probably more so in directing irrigation water. Uh, it, it has been effective, but again, the, if you go deeper, you're, you're better off. And we, 
you know, we have a lot of property where prairie dogs have been removed. That gives us the opportunity to key line at that 12 inch depth also. Uh, and we we did uh, take a look at you know kind of cost effectiveness of bringing this in house. Um, you know the short of it is it it does save money. We looked at it mostly for the perk control. Um, so there is some marginal savings in doing so, uh, and we also recognize that that is added capacity for other parts of the project like the barrier maintenance in particular or the maintenance and construction but we also see that added capacity being important for some of the infrastructure improvements that we need to make on on these properties um, and with that proposal we're talking about a five-year fixed term program coordinator with a temporary employee that you know works during the peak field season we would buy equipment for those folks. We're thinking two full-size perk machines and two of the smaller portable perk machines, along with a vehicle to support um, using those machines. Those machines. So, um, at the current levels, based on the mapping, we would expect that control efforts should be at a maintenance level after five years of control at the current at the current pace and that's one of the reasons why we did this five proposed a five-year fixed term is it, we do think we are going to be at a spot to make another decision regarding how the program moves forward at that point um, we would continue to to do for control um, you know june 1 to february 28th we, we kind of feel like this in-house capacity will eliminate some of the contractor bottlenecks that that we have experienced uh, but it's also, you know, with the many moving parts of the program, there's a lot of work in preparation for the perk machines like barrier construction and this kind of uh, infrastructure maintenance that that can happen to to make, um, you know, help make the program more successful during that time that, you know, where the moratorium is. Um, there will be, there will need to be a an appropriate city budget budget process to do this. So, you know, we really wouldn't expect this capacity to be added until early 2024. Um, you know, I think we all know or recognize that, you know, irrigation is critical for robust ag production here, um, but it also is really important for restoration and, and keeping prairie dogs off properties <clears throat> after removal. Um, and, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, we were a bit surprised at the amount of deferred maintenance. Um, you know, probably to the point where that may have contributed to prairie dog occupation at some of these sites where systems become, became less effective. You know, we didn't have good communication with tenants regarding it, or um, they let us know about it. We didn't, we didn't uh, pick matters or, you know, we didn't make the improvements, but um, anyway, uh, having extra or having good capacity for maintenance and um, doing good assessments, prioritization, getting all that work in budgets is something that we'll be more aware of moving forward. Um, and again, having that added staff capacity that we're proposing will, will help with this component of things. Um, next, please. In the, the grassland ecosystem management plan does include uh, criteria that define these colony designations. And in, in general, the more, desi more criteria they meet, the more protective the, the designation for prairie dogs. Um, you know, I think it's important also to note that the colony management designations are already reviewed on, a, on an annual basis. If if we acquire a, new, acquire a new property that has prairie dogs on it, or if we find a new colony in our mapping efforts, we do run through the criteria and assign a management designation. Um, and some of the management de decisions we make um, may in fact have some uh, impact on how we interpret those uh, colony designations. You know, I mentioned we might find it physically impossible to, to deliver water to a, a historically irrigated property. So one of the criteria is, is it irrigable or currently irrigated? If we find um, that it's physically not possible to irrigate anymore, 
we may interpret that criteria to be no, and, and that may lead to a different designation. Um, it, we're also not proposing any changes to these criteria. They are part of the grassland ecosystem management plan. We're only recognizing that on the ground conditions may change how we interpret these on a particular field site. Um, of course, any changes in designation will be reported at the annual meeting um, and, and you know, a description of why that change was made will be uh, reported there. And with that, I will turn it over to Tori to talk a little bit about uh, relocation alternatives. Camera to go. <laughs> All right, so I'm Tori Poulton, I'm the prairie dog ecologist. I'm gonna talk about um, kind of the current relocation situation. We do intend to continue using relocations as a non-lethal removal method. <clears throat> from these targeted sites for, for removals. Um, and in past years, we've been relocating to the southern grasslands. Um, and that kind of met goals, both of reducing conflict on irrigated agriculture and also bolstering low prey dog populations since uh, up until mapping in 20, fall of last year, 22, the southern grasslands have been below that 10% occupancy target. And again, that range is 10 to 26%. As of mapping of last fall, the southern grasslands hit that 10% target. Um, so another um, part of the grassland management plan is it defines that once we hit that 10% par target, we won't be relocating prey dogs to a grassland preserve. So assuming we stay there after this year, grass, the southern grassland preserves is now um, not an appropriate receiving site for prairie dogs. Um, so we need to start looking at alternatives for relocating receiving sites for relocated prairie dogs. Um, the other in system, in OSMP system option we potentially have are prairie dog conservation areas. There are one or two PCAs in the system that are sparsely occupied right now. Um, but a serious management concern of that is permitting can be pretty challenging. Um, relocations require state permit from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And part of that permitting process is sending notice to all neighbors to the property and um, you know, soliciting their feedback and including that in a permit application packet. And CPW may reject an application if there's considerable opposition to relocation by neighbors. Um, in the past, in some other properties, we've gone through an extensive negotiation and spend a lot of money on barriers. Um, I think we don't want to go that route again to spend that much money on a receiving site. Um, so that's certainly be a consideration looking at uh, prey dog conservation areas. Uh, next slide. There are off-system options. Um, that includes Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge just south of Highway 128. Um, and just south of our southern grasslands, and also the Pueblo Chemical Depot um, farther to the south in Colorado. Um, Rocky Flats is in Jefferson County, Pueblo is in Pueblo County. <laughs> um, another issue with relocating within the state of Colorado is relocating prey dogs across county lines requires that the receiving county commissioners sign off and approve that relocation. So Jefferson County and Pueblo County commissioners have approved that, so that area is out of the way. Um, and we do intend this year for 2023 to um, use Pueblo Chemical Depot as a receiving site for relocated prairie dogs. That takes the pressure off our southern grasslands. We can be compliant with the grassland management plan and not add prairie dogs for a 10% occupancy. Um, the consideration with these is these offsite options aren't available every year. Rocky Flats accepted prey dogs last year for 2022, but they aren't this year for 23. Uh, Pueblo, they're not sure if they're going to be accepting prey dogs uh, next year or upcoming years. Um, I will add. Is it multi faceted or pretty much just related to numbers? Just how many are on? It's multifaceted. So in the case of Pueblo, they are wanting to receive prey dogs and increase the prey dog population there because they um, 
actually have applied for and I believe they've been allocated black-footed ferrets for ferret reintroduction down there. So they're all set up and I think they plan to receive ferrets late this fall in November. Um, and then they'll have to consider the safety of ferrets and bringing in new prairie dogs from off-site and the potential to bring in plague um, because the ferrets are very susceptible to plague as are prairie dogs. So they're kind of, they're not sure <laughs> at this point. That's great. I wouldn't have even thought of that point. So it's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're lucky that it'll work out this year. Um, it will be a new logistics thing since we haven't moved prey dogs off site. Um, so yeah, so we don't have to spend time and effort to repair a receiving site in our southern grasslands. We just need to bust them down to Pueblo. <laughs> so um, looking forward, if Rocky Flats and Pueblo aren't available and we aren't don't have you know reasonable availability on the OSMP system for relocations. We're going to have to look at alternative removal options, um, and it could be just all lethal. I think that kind of doesn't jive very well with the practice of trying to have a conservation-related way to remove prairie dogs. Um, so other options would be trap and donate to conservation programs like Black-Footed Ferret Center up in Fort Collins, or like the Raptor Conservation Center in Greenfield or elsewhere. Um, and I think you know that still generally results in death of prairie dogs, but at least there's still that conservation aspect to it. Um, so we're gonna have to look at that in upcoming years, kind of depending on how populations stay in the southern grasslands and the other grassland preserves and availability of other offsite receiving sites. It's the managing entity for the Pueblo Chemical Depot. Uh, that is really complicated. I did a site visit actually last week. The, um, the folks managing the ferrets and the prairie dog reintroductions is uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, but obviously they're working with DOD. And then, but that it's all in a decommissioning phase. So um, they're going to have a new, oh gosh, I forget the uh, military term, but base commander or something like to that effect coming in, but then that's supposed to cycle out in the next year. So it's no longer DOD. But then just like in a maintenance phase, there's a lot going on, but the main contact is US Fish and Wildlife Service. <laughs> okay, so next step, so I'll kind of set it up for Heather then. <laughs> Great, so following our conversation tonight and any feedback that we get from you on the recommendations, we will be putting together some final recommendations and bringing them back to you on July 12th, uh, next month's meeting. Um, that will be a full agenda item with a public hearing. And the hope at that point would be that OSBT would consider and um, accept those final recommendations. Um, and then we would be taking those recommendations to city council for consideration in um, later in the summer or fall, depending on their scheduling. Um, there would be some follow-up actions depending on which recommendations are included. And that might include modification of the special permit for lethal control, which would come into place if we were expanding beyond the project area and then replacement of the special special rule related to borough disturbance to allow that system line. And then in December, we will hold our annual public meeting and we would discuss all of those modifications to be sure that, that all of the public is, is up to speed on those changes that we've made if they haven't been um, tuned in to OSBT or city council around this matter. And we'd of course be discussing our plans for the 2024 management. And then implementation of any changes would be in 24. Certainly preparation would begin in 23, but um, the actual implementation would begin in 24 so that it's part of the, the budget for 24, staffing for 24, the things that need to happen um, to allow implementation to change. Next. So we would love to hear any questions, feedback on the recommended modifications. And then next, I'm just gonna put up a slide um, just again with the different recommendations that we had of course they're also in your packet um, for any of your questions or um, feedback on those as well as any information or clarification or feedback that would be helpful for you prior to next month um, to help you consider um, the recommendations in july thank you very much uh we appreciate the update uh, it was very helpful uh, 
I'm going to ask a question, then I'm going to ask others to, uh, if they have questions as well. But, you know, we, we heard a lot of concern expressed tonight from neighbors. And so what's our good neighbor policy or program? How are we dealing with, you know, adjacent landowners? And um, how are we going to respond to these concerns that we're hearing um, often? Yeah, I mean, like our standard response to neighbors is that, you know, is, is our practice prairie dogs, we treat them like wild, that wild animals that they are, they're native. Um, and we generally do not attempt to control the movement of wild animals. So, um, you know, recognizing that it can be frustrating for neighbors when prairie dogs, you know, expand from um, open space property onto their property. Um, but yeah, um, so I, I'll provide information about barriers, let them know that they're certainly free or to erect barriers or other management options that they may or may not be allowed to do depending on where they live. Um, and then, and yeah, and I think we, we talked about, and I think we're still working on a cost share program for barriers, but that's been kind of hung up with some legal issues. So we're trying to um, figure out how to <laughs> do that legally. Um, and if we can do it legally. So that's kind of not making a lot of progress right now. Um, and Heather, how does uh, neighbor conflict be, uh, be discussed in the preferred alternative, the 2020 preferred alternative? Yeah, so it is one of the, the prioritization criteria is neighbor conflict. So if we had, if we're looking at a couple of different sites and one had high neighbor conflict and one had low neighbor, neighbor conflict, that would definitely be something that we would take into account. The other thing is that when we are planning to remove prey dogs from a property, um, Andy or his staff will work with the neighbors to see if they would like to do um, removal on their properties at the same time that we are, um, so that that kind of cross boundary movement, you know, ceases. That can also help us certainly with the extent of barriers that we have to put up if they're if they're willing to remove prey dogs at the same time. The other thing that we have done on a number of occasions is, although we haven't cost shared on barriers, um, we have had agreements with um, neighbors that allows them to attach a barrier to our boundary fence, which reduces the cost somewhat because they're not having to erect a brand new um, fence line to put the barrier material on. Great. So Great. my other question Great. would, oh, you, did you want to say something, Dan? Brady, no, just, oh, just calling your attention that Brady's got his hand up. Oh. Go ahead, Brady. No, there's no rush. Go finish your finish your thought, please, Dave. And then just know okay. that I'm, I'm trying to follow protocol here. Whenever I'm in, a <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, so my other question was on the status of water. So when we can't, when we determine that we can't irrigate either irrigate period or satisfactorily, so what happens to the water? Um, you know, what happens to the water right that yeah. presumably runs with that property? Sure. In, in a couple of cases, we have actually done a formal move where we transfer the water to another property. Okay. But in most cases in the Northern Project area in particular or that we're talking about here, um, we have other property on the same ditch system that, you know, maybe of higher quality soil that we move the water to um, or, you know, it's fungible within a particular ditch system. We are just using it on a different property. So we can do that without, uh, going to water court or, you know, yeah, like left-hand for the left-hand water system. We can move any left-hand shares we have to any property that is included in that service area. Okay. Great. Um, you know, and I guess maybe a couple of examples of that is, uh, Bennett and steel. Um, in the past, Bennett um, is kind of water short. We only purchased nine shares. Uh, we did purchase some CBT water with it, but there's no way to, to, to deliver that CBT water to the Bennett property. We, we distribute that to other leases that we can move that water to. Um, but the steel water the last couple of years, we can transfer that to Bennett. So we've been using the steel water on the Bennett property because we just feel like we have a better opportunity there at the moment. Okay. Brady, did you have a question? 
Yeah, a couple of things. One, I just want to thank the staff for excellent reporting and um, an excellent progress. Even the, the the people who who testified called in and were most critical of us acknowledge that you all have made a lot of progress. And um, and and I just think it's a really hard issue. So I just want to acknowledge all those things. Heather, I had a question for you in that initial grid. I don't remember the numbers exactly, but I think in the grasslands overall, our target was 800 to 3,100 acres of prairie dogs and we're up in the low 5,000 acres. And you said it's still kind of in the fine category. Is there a top number at which that becomes red or is it just kind of fine? There is, yeah. So there's okay. specific thresholds set for, for poor, fair, good. And with something like that, you could be poor because you're well below that 800 or you could be poor because you're far in excess of that 3,100. So there is a cutoff. I don't have it in front of me, but there is. We're approaching it at some point. We, we probably are if getting it keeps close. Going up. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right, I just wanted to check in on that. And just a few observations uh, to someone who's admittedly fairly new to this issue. One, I, I was compelled by the 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 landowners who called in who've seen degradation over the years who and and I the cost sharing thing I hadn't even considered that that I mean I'm sure that's complicated but this concept that we would be building these barriers to keep the prairie dogs from coming back in our prayer our property and I don't know I just I just really empathize with what they said and and I I, I would like to see us have a meaningful uh response uh to them, some of whom have been here for for thirty years. If if I'm reading the the packet correctly, even in the best of circumstances, relocation is not cost effective as a uh, compared to lethal control, which just kind of makes intuitive sense. And I, it also sounds like we're running out of places uh, to put the prairie dogs. And so, um, given the fact that it, it would appear that the, the need for control is is greater than our current capacity. And, and I understand we're going to buy, we're proposing, y'all are proposing to buy two big perk machines and two small ones. But even at that rate, it would take us five years to get to a place where we're at a, we've kind of got things under control and we're maintaining. I just think, you know, I would just suggest, and, and I, again, I don't know all the history that, uh, that, that it's maybe time to look at the extent to which that's working and sustainable, the relocation. I think I think you, you basically said we need to do so, and I would just reiterate that it it given the amount of a response that it would appear that we need to make um, doing so efficiently and um, humanely um, would seem to be a good a good strategy and may mean that we need to change our approach um, and. Uh, yeah, th those are my only uh, observations. Thanks for that. Uh, Michelle, I know you wanted to jump in and oh, yeah. ask some questions. I mean, your first question, Heather, was like, um, what did we think about the categorization? I, I thought that was very useful for you to view it in that uh, that way, in those four categories. Um, we got a, a matrix over email, which added like acquisition date and, and, um, and and the the author admitted that there may be some flaws in that data. I thought those data points were pretty helpful, and I was just wondering if if that's something that we could validate in terms of the accuracy and um, and incorporate. Is that feasible for you all to kind of take on? I thought those were uh, meaningful data points, and I just wasn't sure if that's something that you could support. Yeah, we could we could certainly look back at our records and see if we can uh, confirm that it was. I mean, she put in a lot of work. Yeah. And I, I would say, you know, it is interesting because that's a lot of the background information on the properties. That wasn't what we used for the categorization. The categorization was current status of the properties and conditions on the properties. Um, we can certainly take a look at that and see if it seems to line up with. You know, the information that we have. And that certainly is important to consider, although um, previous conditions um, may not be particularly relevant if the current conditions don't allow us to return it to that condition for some reason. I mean, there are some circumstances where we just simply don't have options available to us because of a variety of circumstances to do that. So it's interesting to know what the history of the property was for certain. 
um, but it may or may not inform what the future of the property could be. Gotcha. I guess the one, um, so there's the two columns that I thought were interesting were the, um, and maybe this is in another grid, actually it was maybe that one that you went by in the slide, um, the, the percentage of prairie dog occupation. Um, that that's in her hers here. It's in hers. Yeah. Did you show that on the slide that when that couldn't really no. it's so small? No. Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. What, we, what we do have is information on. I mean, we could certainly calculate that. I think that is one column that probably is pretty substantially different from our data, um, because we're looking at the overlap of the irrigated part of a property with prairie dogs. I think she was looking at, at total prairie dog occupation on a property. So we would probably have fairly different numbers for some properties for that particular metric. Okay, that makes sense. And we certainly have that information. We haven't presented it as um, percentages. But, um, and I mean, we actually have the acreage overlap numbers if, if anybody's interested. Um, we just haven't shown as a percentage. And in, in, in these properties are, um, I mean, you all know which ones are leased. And I, I don't I don't know, like in this particular grid, um, like which one is Autry currently leased? Yeah, it is. It's, okay. And so um, if it's ready to go, we step in and, and um, do some work on it. And then eventually would they take over mitigation at that point? Yeah, it, I think like Autry, for example, with such a small colony, that that's really a recent incursion. It would be very simple to remove, simply flatten the burrows, maybe a little bit of interseeding, but it, it would be ready for production very quickly. So there would be uh, several cases that are like that. There would be some tougher ones like Hartnagel, for example. Um, it has a you know a history of some longer term occupation where we might have to nurse it along for a couple of years before we could turn it over to the tenant for. Uh, you know, we're, we're not really turning them over to the tenant until we feel like they can economically produce something. You know, we could we're not removing and say okay, it's all yours. <laughs> um, so you know we are making sure they're pretty productive before we start collecting rent on them. Where those properties are leased, Andy, uh, the, the tenants aren't uh, providing prairie dog control. That is the department's responsibility, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, in, right. And it, so in the future, that will still, if prairie dogs re-invade or reoccupy, um, that would still then be the department's responsibility to remove them. Yeah, I think overall, but in 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 our proposal to, um, you know, we are proposing to have a couple of those really small portable right. machines. That might be an example where a tenant calls and says, oh, hey, I cut the hay and I noticed there's three or four burrows in that field re removed. That would be how we would, if they're willing to help us out with that, I think we would certainly accept the help to do so. That makes sense. And I just heard other comments like there were no um, prairie dogs at the time of our acquisition and then they moved in and then more moved in. Um, how, how does this all happen? Like, I mean, they're native to this land. There hasn't been a good old fashioned plague in a while. Climate change has to have something to, to do with all of all of this. Yeah, I think I think in most cases, the previous owners were controlling prairie dogs. Mm. prior to our acquisition. In some cases, it may have been that populations were expanding after a plague and so did move back onto the property. Um, but I think, Andy, for probably <coughs> most of these properties, um, they had had prairie dogs in the past but were controlled. Yeah, I, I would say that it's most likely that there was active control prior to city purchase. And we've been restricted up until recently from controlling the prairie dogs correct like we couldn't have right the only the only um, situations that we've used been able to use lethal control on open space in the recent past was following a relocation if there were some animals that we couldn't capture we could then go in with lethal control this project paved the way for that uh, finding by city council that irrigated agriculture was a public improvement project which then allowed lethal control to be used more broadly in that context. But you're right, that's that's only since September of 2020. Um, prior to that, it was it was just a very different. And situation. the and the burl disturbance restrictions was also the major impediment. So burl 
levels really impact how irrigation water would flow. So if it got bad enough, the tenant would simply have no motivation to irrigate the land. And so then that would lead to expansion and because we couldn't disturb the burrows. So the combination of adding those two tools to the toolbox, you know, changed the game essentially for us. So speaking of turning on the water, there was a comment about um, the hours of the day and the week that we turn on the water. <laughs> and I don't know if you could kind of explain what, what that's about. Like, I know we work, um, you know, during the week and not the weekends and all night long. What difference does that make if you work at midnight and turn the water on? Does that make any difference? Yeah, I, I can kind of... Um, so, I mean, there's a couple of components to that. I think you're referring to a comment where we have to call for the water to be delivered to a property. So we do have to formally order the water in a sense to get delivered to the property. Um, and <clears throat> once we, you know, we don't work 24 seven like a rancher might run out right before he goes to bed and, and move the water, we, we don't have staff doing that. Um, so we are somewhat aware about um, you know, how we call the, how we deliver it so that we're not flooding a neighbor. You know, we often will not run on over a weekend because our staff aren't on over the weekend. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't really consider that a huge limitation if, because uh, we do run 24 hours during the work week, for example, of the irrigation water. So, um, you know, if it is available to us to do so. And Andy, there is the role of the tenant as well. I mean, it's just not like we need the staff physically out there. Sure. To run. The tenants are also yes. out there as partners of running the irrigation. Yeah, the reality is that, uh, you know, we, we do have a goal to have um, most of our irrigable land leased for agricultural purposes because the tenants are the ones who are utilizing our water rights on our property, we're, we're doing it on a, a very small scale, like one to 300 acres, say, and the tenants are doing it on the 6,000 acres of irrigated land that we lease to them. So, uh, you know, they're super, super important in, in how we use our water portfolio. And in, in this is a little bit pertinent to the Sombrero Marsh, almost all of open spaces I will say all of open spaces water are agricultural water rights. We don't really have any that can be stored for use at a later time for domestic or for domestic purposes or storage. Uh, we do have a handful of storage rights, but um, almost all of our water is agricultural water. That's direct, directly diverted from the streams. And interestingly, irrigation actually in some cases is also a neighbor relations issue where there are yes. impacts to neighbors of an irrigated property adjacent to them if there's um, water running off of the property onto their property. So we've, we've actually had situations where prairie dogs have been removed, restoring the irrigation, and then that is sort of a new neighbor conflict. Right. Because it hasn't been irrigated for a right. while. And it's sort of a new yeah. Yeah. oasis. I mean, a, a historically one. present, but a, a, new, a newer current situation. Yeah. Sounds very complicated. Yes. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, in, in terms of feedback on it, you know, based on what I've seen, all have done a great job. You know, uh, moving this forward, this is a top subject. Um, you know, expansion outside of the area is great. You know, uh, deeper plowings uh, great. Um, you know, it does seem like, you know, with the reclassification, some of the neighbors are feeling like we're abandoning, you know, some of these properties. Um, I was curious if you care to comment on that a little bit, you know, or, or how do you feel like when we're moving, you know, things from like a D to a C or a C to a D? Um, and, and what does that mean to you all? Yeah, I, I mean, I think actually that is not a change. It's just simply putting more information out there about the conditions on the property. So those are things that we're always considering because we have to come up with a plan each year of what the most effective use of our resources are and what will have the highest benefit. And so how complicated a property is, how likely we are in a relatively short period of time to be able to restore it to irrigated agriculture is a really important consideration in that. 
Um, and so I don't think that the, that the categorization in and of itself changes the prioritization of what we would remove. I think that's still based on those prioritization criteria that were part of the original project. All that it does is help sort of make some of the on the ground conditions maybe more easy for people to understand why decisions are made the way that they are. Um, and don't, don't dictate which of those properties could be selected in any given year for removal. I mean, there may be a year in which we have a couple of really easy removals that we can then package with a far more difficult one um, and make some, some, you know, make some progress on those, at least Bs and Cs. Yep. Um, so, you know, I, I think part of it may be sort of a misunderstanding of what the categories do, which is, is actually nothing other than capture the current conditions and try to make some sense of them. Um, so in a way, by saying something's a C, right, we're, we're helping everyone understand how bad the conditions might be there and how much you know attention it needs um, and helping bring awareness to it in a way, right? Yeah. Uh, one thing I like to think of it is, is, is if C, if, if one property is at a C it's, and it's because of an irrigated infrastructure, irrigation infrastructure issue, very well, we may be currently trying to address that, but it's not showing up as showing up in a future relocation or removal effort because we're we're putting money into the irrigation infrastructure. Once that's completed, then you know we may move on that category C, or we may first say that C is now a B, and yeah, so it's. And I do think also that the redesignation with the grassland plan criteria created some concern along with the classifications. Classifications also don't direct us to redesignate it in any way in the grassland plan. If there are permanent condition changes on a property, that we cannot change, and that would put that property in a different management designation, then we would change the management designation because otherwise we're reporting acres on properties that can't be managed in the way that a transition or a removal area should be. Um, temporary situations, which are things like the needs for additional irrigation infrastructure, um, even the presence of a raptor nest that in five years may not be in that location, you know, that those are temporary changes that may shift in the future. So those would not be properties that we'd be looking at to redesignate because really the the management designations are intended to be something that you're not changing all of the time, right? They're, they're capturing kind of the long-term conditions on the property. I have a few of those, okay. Um, a couple of just really quick ones. There, um, I expect you that it's gonna be a no, but there are no changes to our plague um, management plan. Is that all still the same? The one that I'm looking at is from um, December of 2021, all that is still the same. Um, and then to kind of piggyback off of Brady's question, which will lead it, which will kind of lead into my other one. What Brady said, um, I think is true as far as the cost management, that relocation is more expensive and less effective. What I have understood is there are many interests that would always want to have relocation on the table, and that is just um, how they would like to do it for all of the people that are at the table. Um, in our 2020 plan, that was a very big part of it. Those meetings, um, you know, everyone had a really good chance to be heard, and what I heard was that um, relocation was something that they'd like to keep on the table. So I'm just checking with you if what I just said sounds true or anything to add to it. And then in 2024, is that when there would be a possibility to change how we do things? However, um, knowing that, that that relocation will probably, you know, forever in all states and everyone that deals with um, prairie dogs, that relocation is always going to be there. Or can city council say this, this really isn't working? How would that kind of work moving forward? Whoever I looked at you, but if yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say your characterization is very accurate. Um, you know, relocation has been a long term ongoing conversation within the Boulder community, and you're right, they're very um, lots of different viewpoints on it. Um, relocation has been something that's been highly valued in the community, and for until 2020 was the only option available. 
um, for the most part, except within some very specific circumstances um, to open space for removal of prairie dogs. So adding the lethal control element was a big, big shift. Yeah. Um, and intentionally staff worked with the board and city council to have the target acreage for relocation be up to 40 acres because there are uncertainties around how much we can relocate, um, mostly around receiving sites, but there could be other, um, other things going on. If, if there's been plague, sometimes you can't then relocate from there for some period of time. So there are other things that might happen. Um, whereas the lethal control acres were a, a set, you know, 100 to 200, relocation was up to 40. So if we encountered conditions in the future where we could not relocate because we didn't have suitable receiving sites or there were some other conditions, we could not do any relocation in that year. Um, we had talked in 2020 and 2019 about the concept of trap and donate. Um, and one of the major concerns about that was obviously that if we were doing it instead of relocation, it is a form of lethal control. And also that it essentially costs almost as much as lethal control because you're having to trap the prairie dogs. Um, if we're unable to do relocation, that may be a different conversation about using something like that. And if we have money budgeted for relocation, using that for trap and donate may be, may be different um, than what we were talking about. Go ahead. Um, I have more. Let me. Um, you need, do you wanna? Well, I, I wanna wrap this up if uh, we can, okay. as soon as we can. Um, and then the, do we still have, is it just kind of dormant right now or is very active, um, the Prairie Dog Working Group? Will that kind of arise again down the road or we'll decide how we wanna restructure that or if we do? So the Prairie Dog Working Group itself um, disbanded after their recommendations were finalized and went to city council. Um, those recommendations were accepted by city council in 2018. And so staff is working on implementing that. Tory's position was created um, out of those recommendations and the need for additional capacity to implement them. So um, a lot of her work plan is focused on those. So the recommendations continue to be implemented by the Prairie Working Group as a, an entity is, uh, you know, I don't think that anybody has any plans to restart that process. Okay. So I just think um, kind of reiterating what um, some of the other trustees said, being a good neighbor seems to be an issue. Um, it's a vicious cycle with having the prairie dogs, which then um, destroys the land and then you get all of the invasive weeds um, and it just starts off and, and the subject is hard. So I appreciate everyone doing what they're doing to um, help with the situation. Um, Andy, when you said um, talking about deferred maintenance, I just wanna say thank you for the accountability because I do, hear what um, the folks that are calling in that are saying is just um, kind of acknowledgement that, you know, we have the same problem as other counties and other states when it comes to prairie dogs. And, um, you know, it's, it's certainly not for lack of trying, um, but in that, I think really trying to hear what they're saying, because it seemed like there's a lot of really motivated, um, sees and neighbors and people that are really um, willing to, to do the work to help. So I just encourage us to even um, along with our annual meeting, which is really great to have that as it's um, to reach out to, to these people that are calling and talking to us and, <coughs> and just really keeping that communication open because I think that a huge part of it is feeling acknowledged and heard. You know, if you're a farmer, um, that is what you do, but that really is also who you are. So when you're seeing this happen to your land, it, it affects you, um, you know, much deeper than than perhaps some other jobs can. So um, I, I could actually ask a few more questions, but I, I understand it's late and we need to wrap up. So um, I can follow up, but but thank everyone for their hard work and yeah. One one quick comment on that, it, and. Um, the tenants have been really appreciative of the help and really have stepped up to, to be a real partner in all of this. Um, I think it has given a lot of hope mm -hmm. um, and, and that's been really important for them to 
to see like Bob at Boulder Valley Ranch, there's hope that conditions can really improve for, for his operations. Yeah, I think with stuff like this, like discussion and the ongoing communication is really what um, can move things forward because sometimes it just feels so overwhelming that it feels like not too much happens very quickly. But the more you talk um, and share ideas, that's when you start getting those little jumps, I think. So thank you again. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we definitely appreciate the information. I, th I think it sets a good foundation for uh, the public hearing uh, in July. So uh, we will anticipate that. Uh, the other thing I want, I think we ought to emphasize for this prairie dog management effort, it is 2024 focused. It is not 2023, and I think there is uh, some misconception on that. So we're looking at next year as far as implementing uh, whatever uh, we decide. Uh, Dan, I think you have the last word, and as briefly as that, yes. Can be. Rapid fire, <laughs> rapid fire. As you all know, the Marshall Fire cause was uh, uh, released last week, and uh, sort of a related uh, subject matter is the monitoring work that the Division of uh, Mine and Re Reclamation and Safety um, probably got those mixed up uh, has been performing out of our Marshall Mesa Trailhead site. Um, and uh, we are expecting the findings uh, to be formally released of the, the results of the monitoring. Uh, and, uh, and we also have coinciding some trailhead uh, plans. And so we want, we're just to FYI, we're going to come to you in August to provide you an update on what we're finding out about that abandoned mine, what the monitoring results are telling us, uh, what some possible uh, remediation actions that they might ask uh, the department to consider, the city to consider. And then Jeff and his team will be providing some, uh, uh, regardless of all that going on, some needs uh, to address that trailhead and some changes. So August would be uh, uh, as far as that. Uh, we were planning to give any some more updates on the high waters and impacts to our system. There's, I don't think there's much to report other than there's a few areas where some trails have been underwater for a few periods of time. We have rangers and staff that go out there uh, certainly, if you're hearing anything, feel free to get back to us. We're monitoring the situation. So far, we haven't felt the need to implement any trail closures, uh, but obviously we could do some again tomorrow in a few more days. Uh, uh, but uh, we'll see watching the, watching the system. So thank you. That's it. That's Great. it. Great. Uh, thank you all very much. A rem again, a reminder, next week, the week from today, uh, there is the training. There is a uh, video that we've been requested to review before we go to the training. So don't forget uh, to do that. The training is at the municipal building, 6 to 8.30, Wednesday the 21st. Is there going to be dinner involved in that? No. no. Okay. The, the movie was great. I watched it. Highly recommend it. Great. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks, everybody. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> 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 <laughs>